A good percentage of the team is non-human, he said eventually. But there are humans on the team, although they are generally blessed with extraordinary abilities. So telepaths, pyrokinetics, stuff like that. He nodded. They're mostly used in off-field areas, but they are sometimes placed in the less tenuous field operations. None of which explains why you're out in the field. You're human, but you certainly haven't any sort of psychic abilities. I'm there because I can be. His voice was flat. Obviously, it was a subject he wasn't about to get into. Not yet, anyway. And I very much suspected that if I pushed, he'd clam up totally. And I still had plenty of other questions. So why are the Red Cloaks still after me? That I don't know. He frowned as he dumped several sugars into his coffee, which was surprising given he never used to take sugar. They obviously still want something, but what I have no idea. But even that night I saved your ass, they came after me, and that was before Mark was killed. He nodded. His gaze, when it met mine, held little of the recent darkness. All I could see was concern, not just about what was happening, but for my safety. It was gone almost as soon as I registered it, but it nevertheless had hope fluttering. Which was stupid. Even if the man I knew did still exist somewhere beneath the cloak of darkness and anger, he'd certainly shown no desire toward me. Quite the opposite, in fact. But, he said, we're not entirely sure Baltimore's killing is connected to his work on the Red Plague virus. The way he was killed is not the norm for them. Meaning if they'd been involved, he would have died the same way Professor Wilson died. His gaze suddenly sharpened, and again a tremor ran down my spine. Yet I wasn't entirely sure that tremor was all fear. Then he all but spat, Jackson Miller. Yes. My voice was non-committal. It seems you were right. My meeting him wasn't a coincidence. I should break his fucking neck. Touch him, I warned. And I'll break yours. He studied me for several long minutes. So, it's like that, is it? Yes, I said, though it wasn't. Not yet. He's at least been honest with me, Sam. Unlike you. I'm being more honest right now than I fucking should be, he growled. Don't push me, Emberly. I didn't. Why didn't those things burn up in daylight? Because the Earth's ozone layer blocks 97 to 99% of UV radiation from entering the atmosphere. But vampires still burn when touched by sunlight. Yes, but that's because there's three bands of ultraviolet radiation in sunlight. UVA, UVB, and UVC. It's the combination of all three that kills vampires, whereas the Red Plague victims seem only affected by UVA, or black light, as it's known. I frowned. But from what I understand, UVA is the main source of radiation hitting Earth, meaning the Red Cloak should burn in sunlight. It's the main source, yes. But for some reason, when it's combined with the other two types, the Red Plague victims are immune. That was the second part of your boss's brief. Pinpoint what gave the Red Plague victims their immunity. I bet there are quite a few vamps in town who'd love to get their hands on that sort of research. Especially the Syndicati, which was a point in favor of Jackson's suspicions they were involved somewhere along the line. Given he was killed at night, it's certainly an option we're exploring. The only flaw is that vampires can't cross thresholds uninvited, and that invitation has to be freely given. I nodded. 
which doesn't preclude the possibility of vampires hiring human thugs to do their dirty work. Did you find any prints in Mark's apartment? That, he said somewhat dryly, is not information I'm about to hand over to someone who is not a police officer. Why did you and Miller drive away from the accident? The darkness in him seemed to have receded, but my reaction to his closeness hadn't. It was a constant push-pull of fear and desire that was as confusing as hell. It wasn't an accident, I said bluntly, and we both know it. We were intending to question them, but one came at us. There were two, he interrupted sharply. We only found one. I nodded. The second one was shot and cindered. He frowned. Your flame shouldn't stop them. They didn't. The bullets in the head did. My flames just rendered his body to ash, which blew away on the wind. But why would your flames work in daylight, but not at night? Well, technically they did work. It's just that the UV lights burn them quicker. But Rochelle's flames can't render them to ash. That would be because a fae doesn't create flames. They can only use and control them. And a regular fire, however hot, is totally different from the flames of a phoenix. I couldn't quite keep the sarcasm from my voice. We're spirits, and we burn far hotter. Trust me. Just for a moment, the past seemed to echo in the blue of his eyes. Him and me, and the heat that had once burned unquenched between us. A heat that could still burn between us if the dying embers were given the slightest chance of rebirth. Then the echoes were gone, and all that was left was the anger of our final words. Words I doubted we could ever get past. I pulled my gaze from his and drank some tea. Did you find anything of interest in Baltimore's notes? Not as yet. What about Wilson? What about him? I frowned at him. Well, why was he taken out by the Red Cloaks? We don't know. And wouldn't tell me if you did. He half smiled. Or maybe that should be quarter smiled, because it was a little more than a ghost. Barely there, and yet breathtaking nonetheless. Jackson Miller is a private investigator who's been hired to investigate Wilson's murder. I'm not about to give him, via you, that sort of information. He paused, and that ghost disappeared. You should keep away from him, Emberly. This case is far more dangerous than you know, and Miller is renowned for not knowing when to retreat. Which sounds a whole lot like someone I once knew and it was what had made him such a good cop. But was it also responsible for the darkness I sensed in him today? Had he finally run into a situation that went way beyond his control? A situation far worse than having to shoot his own brother? Which is why I'm giving you a warning, Red. I know just how badly things can go. He half reached out, as if to caress my cheek, then his fingers clenched and he abruptly stood up. Please be sensible. Don't stick your nose into the investigation, and don't skip out on your tail again. I leaned back in my chair and met his gaze for several heartbeats. Fine, I said eventually. I'll be sensible. Relief sparked in his blue eyes, and there was also a touch of disbelief. Understandable, I guess, given he saw me as nothing more than a lying adulteress. One of us will be in contact if we need anything else from you. What if I need to contact you for some reason? He hesitated, then reluctantly reached into his pocket and drew out a card. On it was a cell number. Nothing else. Not even his name. Use that. It's a central number unconnected to me or the team, but any message you leave will be shunted to me as a matter of priority. 
which was better than nothing, I supposed. I accepted the card and shoved it into my purse. Thanks. He nodded and left. No goodbye, no nothing. He just turned around and walked away, like it was easy. I rubbed my eyes wearily and wondered when the hell this stupid, irrational pining would stop. He might be the love of this lifespan, but that just meant he was the one destined to burn my heart to ashes. The sooner I accepted it and got over him, the better. Which is always easier to say than do, my inner voice whispered. I sighed, flicked out some cash for our drinks, then made my way home. Rory was getting ready for his evening shift at the fire station. Hey, he said, a smile on his face and a twinkle in his eyes. His night with Rosie had obviously gone well. What's happening? It seems the gods are still pissed off with me. I dropped down onto the sofa and gave him a brief update on everything that had happened over the course of the day. Christ, he said, handing me a cup of tea. You've well and truly jumped out of your staid and boring existence, haven't you? Yeah, I muttered, and lightly blew on the tea to cool it. He sat down on the coffee table, his arms crossed on his knees. I'm gathering you're intending to ignore Sam's warning and meet with Jackson tonight. And therein lay the difference between Sam and Rory. Rory knew immediately what I'd do. Sam, even after all that had happened between us, wanted to believe I'd keep my word. But then what chance had Sam ever really had to understand me? I'd been too fearful of his reaction, too desperate to enjoy my time with him before fate stepped in once again to destroy everything, to tell him what I was. And by the time I'd tried, it was altogether too late. Sam's got people watching me, so I'm planning to sneak off at sunset. Is the roof code still the same? Rory nodded. He was more attached to his firebird form than I was, and tended to risk evening flights at least a couple of times a week, some of them from the rooftop and some out in the country. Just be careful, and if you and Jackson need some extra muscle, you know where to find me. Thanks. He smiled, leaned forward, and kissed my forehead. Have fun, and don't be surprised if Sam discovers your absence sooner rather than later. Whatever I might think of him otherwise, he's a very good cop. I know, I shrugged. But I just can't sit around and do nothing. Well, you could, but you've always liked a challenge, and that's what this has turned into. He paused, then added a wry edge in his voice. And with this case, there's both a mystery and a man. I'm not interested in Sam. Did I specify which man I was talking about? He interrupted mildly. No. I tore my gaze away from the amusement in his. Damn him to hell for knowing me too well. As I said, just be careful. I'd hate to see him hurt you again. He won't. It was said with determination. After all, a phoenix's heart was supposed to break only once each lifetime, and I'd already had my turn. Good. He squeezed my knee, then rose and continued getting ready for work. By the time I'd finished my drink, he'd left. I stripped off my clothes and had a shower, but as I was heading into my bedroom, my phone beeped. I walked into the living room and dug it out of my purse, noting in the process that glint in the window opposite. The old guy was watching again. I shook my head at his persistence and looked at the text. It was from Jackson, and all it said was, Rubbish. Make of that what you will, Sam, I thought with a smile. I tucked the phone back into its pocket inside the purse, 
then went back into my bedroom. Selecting a simple A-line dress for now, and a more figure-hugging silk for later in the evening. Once my shoes had gone into the backpack, I slung it over my shoulder and headed out. But I went up the fire escape to the roof, not down in the elevator to the lobby. The evening air had grown cool, and the setting sun was beginning to render the sky with vivid splashes of color. I walked across to the cooling towers and waited for the splashes to grow, the breeze in my hair and excitement in my veins. I might not take firebird form very often, but it always made my blood sing when I did. As the sunset began to reach its zenith, I unzipped the back of my dress so that the pack touched skin. It wouldn't be enveloped in the magic that allowed me to shift from one form to another if it wasn't. Then I closed my eyes and called forth the firebird. She came in a rush that was fierce and frightening, a storm of energy that swept me from flesh to fire and then bird in quick succession, leaving me breathless and more than a little dizzy. Damn, I obviously need to do this more often. It was a thought that quickly disappeared as I raised glowing red-gold wings and leapt for the sunset-painted skies. It was a glorious sensation, and the urge to simply fly and enjoy not only the freedom but the power of the evening was a hard one to resist. But Sam was down there somewhere, and as Rory had noted, he wasn't stupid. He knew I was a phoenix, and it wouldn't take him long to connect the appearance of a firebird to me. So I swung around and headed into the city. Jackson and I were supposed to meet at the Crown Towers, but given I didn't have easy access to their rooftop, I flew around until I found a building within walking distance that had an external fire escape. I shifted form as I flew down, landing half-crouched but on two feet. After doing up my dress, I made my way down the metal stairs and walked to the Crown. The woman at the rather opulent reception desk gave me a warm smile. How may I help you? I have a booking under the name of Tip. Just a moment. She tapped some keys, then gave me a key card. Mr. Tip has already checked in. Room number is 158. Elevators are just along the corridor to your right. Thanks, I said and headed up to our floor. I walked along the bright corridor until I found room 158, then swiped the card through the slot. The door swished open, revealing a large living area bathed in the remnants of the fading sunset. Jackson was standing near the wall of floor-to-ceiling windows. His auburn hair was damp, curling lightly around his ears and at the nape of his neck and he wasn't wearing anything more than a towel wrapped around his waist. He turned around as I entered, revealing a body every bit as lean and hard as it had felt under his shirt. But it wasn't so much his magnificent physique that had my heart slamming against the walls of my chest, but rather the raw hunger in his eyes. It radiated out from him in an all-consuming wave, and it momentarily snatched my breath and threatened to buckle my knees. The fire fay had finished waiting. The door swished shut behind me. I slung my backpack onto the nearest sofa and walked across to the windows. Amazing view. My gaze was on the city vista laid out before us, but every other sense was attuned to the man standing so close. Isn't it? His voice was little more than a deep rumble of sound, but I knew his gaze was on me rather than the view, and the heat of it had pinpricks of sweat skittering across my skin. I swallowed heavily. God, I was a bundle of raw nerves and heady excitement. Anyone would think I was a virgin on her first date. Would you like something to drink? He asked. I nodded. A glass of red wine would be lovely. I watched his reflection walk across to the minibar and tried to think of something, anything, 
other than the desire to rip the towel away from his waist and caress the body underneath. What time does Radcliffe usually get here? I asked eventually. I'm told most nights it's somewhere between ten and midnight, he said, walking back. He stopped and handed me a glass. The wine inside was dark red, its aroma rich and berry-filled, with hints of chocolate and wood spices. I took a sip, but barely even tasted it. My senses were too attuned to the man now standing behind me. What about his guards? If he's so security conscious, I doubt he'd walk into the room of a stranger, however much he might want to fuck her, without first letting his guards do a sweep. I have prepared a hiding spot, he murmured. But let's not talk about that right now. The sound of my dresser's zipper sliding down seemed abnormally loud in the brief silence. Expectation tumbled through me, and my breathing quickened. I took a sip of wine and ignored the urge to just turn around and take what we both so obviously wanted. Sometimes a slow seduction was infinitely better than the act itself, although I very much suspected that would not be the case here. His breath brushed the back of my neck, and my nipples went tight. I gulped down some more wine, but it didn't do a lot for the sudden dryness in my throat, or the tension thrumming through my body. For several minutes, nothing else happened. There was just his breath on my neck, the heat of him rolling across my spine, and the growing tremble of expectation. What happened to your back? He asked eventually. I had a slight disagreement with a car fire, I said, half shrugging. It won. Slight disagreement is something of an understatement. His fingers moved lightly over the ruined flesh. I could barely feel it, but even so, delight shivered through me. But I would have thought a fire spirit would be able to control fire. I can, but there were too many witnesses to even attempt it. Damn shame. He slid his arms around my waist, his lips branding my neck as one hand slid downward and skimmed the front of my panties. A moan escaped. He chuckled softly, but explored no further, his caress sliding back up, not down. He hooked his thumbs under my bra and pushed it up over my breasts. Then he cupped them, pressing them together as his clever fingers began to tease and pinch my nipples. I leaned back against him and slid my free hand behind me, tugging the towel from his waist. I tossed it to one side, then caressed his shaft. He was big, gloriously so. I don't think I should be the only one naked here, he murmured, then plucked my wine glass from my hand and placed it on the nearby table. He slid my dress from my shoulders, and my bra and panties quickly followed. I was naked and standing in front of a window for all the world to see, and I couldn't have given a damn. He pressed close again, his cock sliding between my legs, thrusting gently, teasing but not fully entering. My nostrils flared, and I drew in the heat of him. It slid through me as sweetly as his caresses, fueling the hunger, feeding the fires. His hand slid down my body, his touch so hot it felt like he was branding me. This time, though, he didn't retreat. His fingertips found my clit, his touch firm as he kissed my shoulders, my neck, my ear. My breathing sharpened, became moans of pleasure I couldn't control, as the pressure built and built from within. But just as I was reaching boiling point, he pulled away, gliding his hands back up to my breasts, pinching and teasing and caressing until the tremors eased. Then he started all over again, and then again, until I was so tightly wound it hurt. Time, I thought raggedly, for a little revenge. 
I spun around, dropped to my knees in front of him, and took him into my mouth. He shuddered, his fingers tangling in my hair as his body tensed and a groan escaped. Slowly, I moved my lips down his shaft, gradually taking in more of him, teasing him with my tongue, playing with him as he'd played with me, bringing him to the brink and then pulling away, time and again, until the heat of his desire was so fierce, my inner fires were becoming drunk on the taste of it. And suddenly, tasting him wasn't enough. I wanted to claim all of him. I rose and pressed a hand against his chest, pushing him back onto the sofa. His hands came to my waist as he sat down, guiding me down onto him, but not allowing me to fully capture him. Kiss me, he growled. So I did, with all the desire, all the need and hunger that burned within me. After several long minutes, he finally released his grip on my waist. His thick cock speared me, going so deep it felt like he was reaching for my very core. Sheer, intense pleasure tore a gasp from my throat, a sound that was quickly swallowed as his lips crushed mine a second time. I rode him slowly, trying to prolong the glorious moment. My clit rubbed against him with every movement, heightening sensation, intensifying pleasure, until I couldn't think, couldn't breathe, could only enjoy. Look at me, Emberly. It was a demand, not a request. But my gaze fell into his green eyes nevertheless, and I drowned in the rising urgency there. His heat swirled around me, through me, fueling the inner fires to breaking point, making them rage and want. I gave in to need and sipped from the furnace of his soul. And God, it was glorious. Our movements became more urgent, more frantic, until it felt like I would shatter into a thousand different pieces. Then I did the intensity of my orgasm making me moan in pleasure as my body shook and shuddered. He came a heartbeat later, his body stiffening underneath me, his release a hot stream so very deep inside. I slumped forward, the side of my face pressed against his chest as I battled for breath and listened to the frantic pounding of his heart, a rhythm that matched my own. Good Lord! he murmured, after several long minutes. I knew that as fire beings we would be good together, but that was totally fucking amazing, I finished for him. His laugh was a rumble that vibrated through the very core of me. His fingers lifted my chin, then he claimed my lips, his kiss tender and yet filled with a fire that was banked, but not yet quenched. We should go to bed, he said softly. And mess up the sheets a little. A little, I teased. If we only mess them a little, I shall be sorely disappointed. He laughed again, then swung his feet off the sofa and lifted me as he rose. Then I shall make it my aim to ensure that over the next couple of hours... You are not left disappointed. Needless to say, I wasn't. I smoothed down the sides of my silk dress with nervous fingers, then took a deep breath and leisurely entered the exclusive mahogany room. Normally I wouldn't have been allowed anywhere near the place, but the same contact that had given Jackson all his information had also provided me with a VIP card. I plucked a glass of bubbly from the tray of a passing waiter and kept walking, trying not to gawk at the plush surroundings and the heavy chandeliers that dominated the roof line. The tables were only half full and the bar and lounge area almost empty. Marcus Radcliffe III was easy enough to find. He was one of three men sitting at the second of the blackjack tables, and the only one who had two rather stern-looking men standing at his back. 
He was bigger than I'd thought he'd be, a thick-set, muscular man who oozed confidence and power. There was a whole lot more arrogance in his thin, pockmarked features than had been evident in the photo, but his eyes were no less beady, and he still reminded me somewhat of a rat. I sashayed across to the lounge and selected a chair that was just within his line of sight. I sat, crossing my legs, allowing the side slit of my dress to fall open and reveal a long length of thigh. It didn't take long for Radcliffe to notice. He leaned back and whispered something to beefy guard number one. The guard nodded, walked across to the bar, talked to the bartender, then went back to his post. Two minutes later, a waiter approached me. Compliments of the gentleman at table number two, he said, offering me another glass of bubbly. Thanks, I said, accepting it. I glanced past the waiter, found Radcliffe watching me, and raised the glass in salute. He smiled. It was a hunter's smile. A shudder went through me. I'd met men like him in the past, and they were always mean in bed, mean and dominant. Thankfully, it was never going to get that far. I remained where I was, sometimes watching him, sometimes not. His expression became more enamored, his eyes heavy-lidded with lust. Eventually, I took a pen and piece of paper out of my bag, wrote my room number on it, then called the waiter over. Could you give this to the gentleman at table too, please? He looked across. Mr. Radcliffe. Mr. Radcliffe was staring at the two of us, his body practically trembling in expectation. Yes. I placed the note and a tip on the waiter's tray. As he left, I rose and sauntered toward the door. My gaze clashed with Radcliffe's a final time, and as the waiter approached him with the note, I blew Radcliffe a kiss and then left. Once out of the mahogany room, I moved as fast as was possible in ultra-high heels, needing to get to the elevator before he did. I closed my eyes and released a breath as the doors closed and the elevator zoomed me upward. One part down. All we had to do now was hope that Radcliffe took the bait. I walked down the hall to our room and opened the door. Okay, I said as I walked in. All systems are go. The rest of the sentence froze in the back of my throat. It wasn't Jackson standing there waiting for me. It was Sam. Chapter 7 What the fuck are you doing here? The words were out before I could stop them. A question I was about to ask you, he snapped back. I thought you'd agreed not to skip away from your tail and to keep your nose out of this investigation. No, I agreed to be sensible, and I am. Where's Jackson? He wasn't in the living area, that was for sure, and I couldn't see any sign of a scuffle. I couldn't imagine he'd let himself be arrested easily, but then I didn't know him well enough to be sure of that. Jackson has been immobilized and is in the next room. We appropriated it when we realized what you two were up to. I eyed him for a moment. The darkness in him was very present, a dangerous energy that skimmed my skin and made it burn. But his anger, despite his tone, wasn't as fierce as I'd thought it would be. And just how did you find us? Did you really think we wouldn't have an eye on Radcliffe ourselves? We knew it was a possibility, but we did have our fingers crossed that you didn't know about the tenuous connection between Sherman Jones and Marcus Radcliffe. His smile held little humor. If a private investigator can find out about it, why would you believe we wouldn't? We have resources Miller could only dream about. There was nothing I could say to that, so I simply asked, How long have you been watching him? Since the murder. He's not a hard man to find, 
even if he is an extremely difficult man to pin down otherwise. So basically, you saw both me and Jackson arrive? Yes. He shrugged. We could have pulled you out then, but I was curious enough to see what you had planned. And obviously, he had no lingering sense of regret or jealousy, because he'd allowed me to come to this room and spend several leisurely hours with Jackson. He'd totally moved on. It was a shame there were still pockets of me that couldn't and wouldn't. Meaning you couldn't get close to him, or that Radcliffe really can spot a cop a mile away, however delicious the bait. He grimaced. The latter. Rochelle tried several nights ago. He totally ignored her. So despite the fact that you've warned me away from the investigation, you're not above using me if it suits a purpose. Totally. His cool blue eyes bored into mine. In the end, the only thing that really matters is the investigation. Everything else, everyone else, is collateral damage. Charming. I walked over to the bar and poured myself a large glass of red wine. We were planning to drug Radcliffe via a drink. Is that still an option, or have you something better planned? We have plans, and given Radcliffe will probably have his goons do a sweep of this room before anything happens, Adam and I will be waiting next door. Which doesn't exactly tell me if you still want me to administer the drug, or whether Adam is going to do his vampire telepathic thing and render them all senseless. He half smiled. Again, it was a fleeting thing, but it nevertheless stirred an ache deep in the heart of me. He will do his telepathic thing, and implant appropriate memories as necessary, both before and after we have the information we need from him. I nodded. You realize that he's going to have to include memories of Radcliffe messing around with me? Yes. He studied me for a moment, his expression closing over. How are you going to get around that problem? I didn't think you were telepathic. I'm not. Jackson and I were going to make a little noise once Radcliffe was completely out of it. I shrugged, my gaze on Sam's, watching for a reaction, any reaction. There was nothing. Why the hell I was expecting one, I have no idea. I really, really needed to get past this. He would have come to in the morning with a sore head and no memory of the night's events, but his guards would have had plenty of action to report. There's one flaw in your plan. Miller would never have gotten past the guards' pre-seduction search of the room. I flicked a hand toward the sofa positioned near the minibar. If you'd care to tilt that up, you'll see it's actually been stripped of all its stuffing and springs, providing enough room for a man to hide. And given Radcliffe's guards were both human they shouldn't have been able to sense or scent Jackson. Whether Radcliffe would have was another matter entirely. Sam grunted, then touched his ear lightly. For the first time, I noticed he was wearing an earpiece. Okay, he said after a moment. Radcliffe is on his way up. Adam and I will be next door. Just make sure you don't leave it to the last moment to capture their minds and render them harmless, I said. I do not want Radcliffe's grubby paws anywhere near me. He snorted softly. Should have thought of that before you started all this. My gaze narrowed. Fine. Just remember, I literally can play with fire. So if you'd like a crispy suspect, just take your time. A crispy suspect is not going to help either of us, he retorted. So don't make empty threats. My sudden smile held little humor. Oh, trust me, my threats are rarely empty. He eyed me for a moment, then shrugged and made for the door. We'll wait until the guards check before we move. Adam can only cope with a couple of mines at a time. I leaned a hip against the minibar and watched him leave. 
Two minutes later, there was a knock at the door. My mouth went suddenly dry. I might have once been a cop, but I'd never been undercover. This was a whole new level of danger to me, and as much as I hated to admit it, it was both scary and exhilarating. I took a sip of wine, then walked across to the door. Who is it? Marcus Radcliffe. His voice was low and rough with excitement. I shivered in distaste, but forced a smile and opened the door. Well, hello there, I said, in what I hoped was a suitably sultry voice. His gaze swept me up and down, and his expression became predatory. Do I get to know your name, mysterious lady? Oh, I don't think so. My gaze went past him. And I'm afraid this is a party for two, not four. He smiled. It was all teeth and falseness. Of course not. However, I hope you don't mind if they come in and do a security check of the place. I'm afraid a man of my wealth does have to be careful. He placed a heavy emphasis on wealth, and I raised my glass to hide my smile. He might have been trying to impress me, but over the many centuries I'd been alive, I'd probably lost more money than he could ever hope to have. Rory and I were not the greatest money managers in the world, but we always had enough squirreled away to live comfortably each lifespan. I stepped back and opened the door wider. Please, be my guest. The two men came in. I watched them search for a moment, then said, Would you like a drink? That red wine you're drinking looks good. I walked across to the minibar. He followed me a little too closely, his nearness burning across my skin like an unpleasant rash. I poured him a glass and then topped off my own, all the while aware of just how closely he watched my movements. He really didn't trust anyone. Drugging him, as Jackson and I had planned, would have been difficult. I turned around and offered him the glass. He smiled and took mine instead. One can never be too careful, he murmured. He ran his tongue across the lipstick that smudged the rim, then licked his lips. Raspberry. Nice. My gaze narrowed slightly. He could taste the flavor of my lipstick from a smudge on the glass. Maybe he was a rat. A were-rat. Just because all the ones I'd seen over the years had been lowlifes who tended to infest the bottom rungs of the criminal ladder, it didn't mean they all did. I lightly clicked my glass against his. To tasting more than just raspberry. Hunger flared deep in his beady depths. I shivered again and hoped like hell he took it for desire rather than distaste. The two men came out of the bedroom. All clear, boss, the beefier of the two said. No other people, no bugs. Radcliffe nodded. Then please wait outside. They retreated. The door closed behind them with an ominous click. Radcliffe stepped forward and placed his glass on the cabinet beside me. Now let's... I neatly sidestepped his grab and gave him a smile. There's no pleasure in rushing, Marcus. Let's sit on the sofa and get to know each other a little more intimately. I gave him a sultry smile. Before we actually do get intimate... I cast a hopeful glance at the wall that divided this room from the one Sam was in. Although I wasn't sure why, given they couldn't see me, and wouldn't know I was more than ready for this charade to be over. But as Sam had said, I'd made this bed, and now I had to lie in it. Although if it came to that, I sure as hell wouldn't. I might want to solve the mystery of Mark's death, but I certainly wasn't willing to bed a rat to do so. 
If things got too heavy, I'd start a freaking fire and have the hotel evacuated. I sat on the sofa and patted the spot beside me. As he sat, his leg brushed mine. His closeness made my stomach turn, but I resisted the urge to move away. So, tell me a little about yourself. He shrugged. I own several second-hand businesses. They obviously do well, I said. That's an Armani suit, isn't it? He raised a hand and lightly touched my neck. I once again resisted the impulse to pull away and took another drink of wine. A lady who knows her suits, he murmured, his gaze becoming distracted as his fingers slipped down my throat and came to rest on my pulse point. It was hammering. Hopefully he'd take it as excitement rather than disgust. Of course, the suit makes the man. I paused, then asked, And is the man married? Of course not. It was smoothly said, but his gaze flickered briefly from mine. His fingers were on the move again, slipping down toward my breast. I held myself still, even though the flight urge was becoming stronger and stronger. God, what the hell was Sam and Adam doing? Just as his fat little fingers were about to splay over my breast, he froze. A heartbeat later, the door opened. Sam and a tall, thin man with grey eyes and blondish hair walked in. The vampire Adam, presumably. I scrambled clear of both the sofa and Radcliffe, then swung around to face the two men. You took your damn time. Sam shrugged. Caution is always better than carelessness. He glanced at Adam. My look passed between them, and unease swelled through me. Something was going on. Something that meant bad news for me. Sam walked toward me. I watched him approach, my wariness increasing and my heart racing with increasing speed. Something was wrong. Something was very wrong. I'm sorry, Red, but you can't stay here. Why the hell not? My throat was dry and my stomach was beginning to churn more thoroughly. This is our room, not yours. That's true, but this is our investigation. You and Miller were warned not to interfere. Alarm ran through me. I stepped away from him. Fire flickered across my fingertips little sparks ready to explode at the slightest notice. What the hell are you intending to do, Sam? Catch you, he said. As if his words were a trigger, my head began to spin and my knees buckled. He caught me one-handed, retrieving the wine glass with the other. The wine, I thought. He drugged the wine. Bastard! Totally, he agreed. But it's not like you didn't already know that. The room began to fade in and out of focus. It took me a few moments to realize we were moving, and by the time I did, we'd stopped again. Cool hands touched my forehead, and an odd sort of buzzing ran around my brain. Vampire Adam was attempting to access my mind. Good luck with that. I thought, and wasn't entirely sure whether I said it out loud or not. Then the touch was gone, the room was gone, and all that I was left with was darkness. Waking was hell. There was a madman armed with a vice intent on squashing the hell out of my head, and my stomach seemed determined to lodge itself somewhere in my throat, I groaned and rolled over onto my back. My bare back. I was naked. In bed. The thought had me lurching upright, but the movement was too sudden and my stomach rebelled. Whoa, a familiar voice said. 
Aim for this. A bucket appeared under my nose, and I promptly lost everything I'd previously eaten that day into it. When there was nothing left, it was whisked away, and I lay back down on the bed, flinging an arm over my eyes and groaning lightly. After a moment, footsteps approached. Where the hell are we? Still at the crown. Jackson's voice was grim. Just in the room next to ours. Did they drug you too? Yeah. It was in the wine, apparently. Bastards. Did they also try to erase your thoughts? He laughed softly. They certainly tried, but the mind of a fae isn't as easily influenced as a human's, and mine less so than most. And a phoenix couldn't be influenced at all. We were spirit, a totally different life form from human, vampire, shifter, or where. I scrubbed the back of my hand across my eyes, wondering whether I had enough energy to go find my bag and grab some aspirin out of it. I'm guessing they put us in bed together, I asked, wondering who'd undressed me, and why it even mattered. Yeah. The bed dipped as he sat down next to me. Here, take this. I opened my eyes. He was holding out a glass of water and two white pills. Aspirin. God, I think I love you. He laughed softly. I'm a fae. We don't do love. Just plain old lust. I downed the painkillers, swishing some of the water around to take away the lingering bitterness. I know, but you'd be quite safe from me emotionally even if you did. Good. He plucked the glass free from my hand. But I just wanted to make sure we both understand where we stand. Hate for either of us to want what they couldn't have. What I want is sex. But not, I added hastily, as a lusty gleam appeared in his eyes. Right at this particular moment. He laughed and rose. I noted in amusement that he was more than half ready for action. I resisted the temptation and dragged myself into a sitting position. I don't suppose you gleaned any information from them before you were knocked out. He shook his head as he dumped the glass back in the ensuite. Those two were clams. What about you? I grimaced. Not really. The drug took effect before they began questioning Radcliffe. I hesitated, remembering my brief conversation with him. Is he married? Jackson plopped down next to me and stretched his long legs out beside mine. Not that I know of. Why? Because when I asked him, he said no, but his body language said yes. Why would he lie about something like that? I shrugged. Given he's into the black market, maybe he doesn't want anyone to know about her. Maybe he fears she could be used as leverage against him. Possible. His expression was contemplative as he began to run his fingers idly up and down my leg. My head might be locked in pain, but the rest of me seemed to be in fine working order. Did either of the cops hear him say that? Not that I know of. I hesitated. But Adam, the vampire, would have read his thoughts. He'd surely know. Not necessarily. His touch was slowly moving around to my inner thigh. Anticipation began to thrum through me. So much, I thought wryly, for the headache. Despite what humans think, not all vampires are telepathic. And the ones who are usually need to be very specific in what they're looking for. They haven't got carte blanche access to the mind, especially when it comes to wares. Yeah, but knowing Sam, he'd have someone on his team who was one of those few who did. I paused. So Radcliffe was a were rat He glanced at me, his expression surprised. You couldn't tell? 
I thought he was, but the senses of a phoenix aren't that specific. But they're very prettily packaged. I smiled at the compliment. So our next course of action is looking for the wife. His hand slipped between my legs and the caressing continuing, running up and down my inner thigh, sending shivers of delight racing through my body. Either that, or we attempt to find out who else Sherman Jones worked with. He's our only other lead. He's missing. Someone on the streets will know something. They always do. His fingers lightly brushed the junction of my legs, then moved away again. I resisted the urge to growl in frustration. We do have one other option, although I dare say the cops have already checked it. What's that? His voice was becoming more and more distracted. This time his fingers didn't brush. They slid through my slickness, caressing and teasing. I took a somewhat shaky breath and somehow managed to say, The waitress. The waitress. The one my boss used to chat with every morning. Then she's definitely an option. He shifted, grabbed my hips and tugged me down the bed. However, he added as he slid his body over mine, there's only one woman I want to talk to right now. Except there wasn't a lot of talking from that moment on, just a whole lot of loving, until an hour had passed and we were both replete and exhausted. Best cure for a hangover ever invented, he said, his breathing a harsh rasp as he finally lay down beside me. Unfortunately, we now have less than half an hour to be out of here. I glanced at the clock. It was nearly 10.15, which meant I was more than a little late for work, if I had a job left, that was. I shifted onto my side and propped my head up with my arm. I need to go to the lab and report in. I'll drive you there, then walk across to the cafe and apply some fey charm to the waitress. He hesitated. She got a name. Sandy, I think but there was also Michelle he often talked to. One of them reported Sherman Jones lurking about, but I'm not sure which. Good. As you said, the cops have probably gotten everything out of them, but it doesn't hurt to double check. I nodded, then swung my legs off the bed and headed for the shower. Unsurprisingly, he followed. Exhaustion in the fay was apparently a rather short-lived state, it meant my shower was rather longer than intended, and we barely checked out of the hotel in time. We parted company just down the road from the Chase Research Institute, and as I headed inside, the awareness of being watched again rose. It seemed my official watcher was still very much on the case. Hey, Emberly, Ian said, his brown eyes somber when they met mine. Heard you had one hell of a weekend. You could say that. I picked up the pen and signed in. I don't suppose Abby has left a message for me. I hadn't received anything on my phone, which was slightly odd, given everything that had happened. Yeah, as a matter of fact, she has. Lady Harriet wants you upstairs ASAP. Upstairs? As in her office? He nodded gravely. Afraid so. God, that cannot be good, I muttered. Wish me luck. Luck, he stated cheerfully, making me smile as I headed for the elevators. Lady Harriet's offices were on the top floor of the Chase building. I'd never actually been there before. When they'd employed me, I'd gotten as far as the personnel offices two floors down, Plebes were rarely invited any higher, so it was with some trepidation that I stepped out of the elevator and walked along the plushly carpeted corridor to the double doors that presumably led into her offices. They swished open as I approached. Abby looked up from the landing strip-sized desk she sat behind. Emberly, 
she said, her voice oddly distant. Miss Chase has been expecting you. Yeah, sorry, but it's been one hell of a weekend and I slept. That is not important right now, she interrupted. Please go straight in. She pressed a button on the control panel to her right, and the doors directly in front of me opened. The room beyond was both huge and shadowed, and it suddenly felt like I was stepping into the den of an ogress. Unease stirred, and I had to force my feet forward. The floor-to-ceiling windows that ran the full length of the room should have flooded it with light, but the heavy curtains were drawn, making me wonder if Lady Harriet had a vampire-like phobia about sunlight. She wasn't one, of course, because she was often out and about during the day, going to meetings and doing interviews. But the utter darkness was still odd. A huge bank of bookcases lined the wall to my right, and to the left there were two doors, both of which were closed. Harriet Chase sat impassively behind a mahogany desk, which dominated the centre of the room. Only she wasn't alone. A man lounged casually in one of the visitor's chairs in front of the desk. Even seated, he looked tall, and he had grey hair and old-fashioned rimmed glasses that perched precariously on the end of his nose. He had the air of a professor, but as my gaze met his, the image that rose wasn't scholarly. It was of death herself, she was standing close by his shoulder, waiting for her chance to reach out and take my soul. I stopped, my heart hammering and my mouth suddenly dry. You wanted to see me, Miss Chase, I said, my gaze still on the man in the chair rather than Harriet herself. Yes, she said, her voice almost mechanical. Professor Baltimore's death is both unfortunate and untimely, but his work is far too important and must be continued. I didn't say anything. I couldn't. Fear of the man in front of me had frozen over my throat. Luckily, Professor Heaton here is available to jump on board at short notice. She beamed at the man. It was a false thing, and hard to believe. We are extremely lucky to have him. I'm the one who is lucky. His voice was a low rumble of sound and surprisingly pleasant. The total opposite of what I'd been expecting. Baltimore was someone I admired greatly. I'm honored to be picking up where he left off. Where Mark left off was being dead. I somehow doubted he'd find that such an honor. Of course, given you worked with Professor Baltimore for so long, Emberley, Harriet continued. And you're already familiar with his research. It is in everyone's interest for you to continue your position as an assistant to Professor Heaton. Work for death? Not if I could help it. I wasn't that desperate for a peaceful job in this lifespan. But... It came out croaky. I swallowed heavily, then added, I'm technically not a research assistant. I rarely did more than transcribe his notes. And she knew that, so why the pretense? She half shrugged. Again, it was an almost mechanical gesture. That doesn't alter the fact that you're more familiar with his work than most. So could you take Professor Heaton down to the labs to familiarize himself with the workspace? What, now? I squeaked. Now, she said firmly. It is more than two hours into your workday, after all. Heaton rose from his chair in one long, fluid movement, and I resisted the urge to step back from him. He reached across the desk and shook Harriet's hand. I cannot wait to get to work, Ms. Chase. His words sent another chill down my spine as visions of Mark, tied to a chair and beaten to death, rose like ghosts to taunt me. He swung around and swept a hand toward the door. 
Shall we go, Miss Pearson? No, my inner voice said. No. But I forced my feet to turn around and walk out of the office. He followed, a somber, forbidding presence who seemed to loom over me. He drew close the minute we left Abby's office, until every breath seemed filled with the non-scent of him, and my skin crawled in distaste. Only he didn't just have no smell. There was no heat in him, no sensation of life. I remembered Abby's lack of life, Lady Harriet's mechanical responses, and my heart suddenly lurched. He was a vampire, and he'd been controlling them both. I closed my eyes briefly and battled to remain calm. One thing was abundantly clear. I couldn't get into the elevator with him. I couldn't go anywhere alone with him. If he'd been controlling them to get at me, then he certainly couldn't intend anything good. The urge to run was hard to ignore, but if I moved too soon, didn't plan my escape, he'd have me. Vampires were fast, super fast. My gaze swept the corridor almost frantically and came to rest on the fire escape down at the far end. I took a long breath, gathering courage, then strode forward, punching the elevator call button and hoping like hell the one closest to the fire escape answered. It was the one I'd come up in, and given how little time had passed, there was a good chance it was still sitting on this floor. The light above the doors flicked on, and I moved toward it with relief. Such prompt service, Eaton said, as if to make conversation. Maybe he sensed the tension in me and was trying to calm me. Maybe I was overreacting and he was just a professor who intended me no harm. But if that was the case, why mind control the two women? I clenched my fists against the flames fighting for release. I had to time this precisely if I didn't want to provide the security cameras with more of a show than they were expecting. I might not want to work for this vampire, but I wasn't about to out myself as something other than human, either. Of course, that was presuming the cameras were actually working. Heaton's appearance had all the hallmarks of a well-planned raid, and I doubted he'd chance the police using security cam images to track him down if something went wrong. But would he know that Lady Harriet had a separate system working in her office? Few people did. I knew only because I'd been working late the night it had been installed. It might have been a secret installation, but no one had informed the workmen and they hadn't minded telling a curious female what they were up to. As the elevator doors were fully opened, I pretended to stumble. Heaton was following so close that not even his vampiric speed could prevent him from running into me. As he did, I caught his arm and yanked him forward with every ounce of strength I had, so that he sailed over my back and crashed into the rear wall of the elevator. Then I spun and ran like hell for the stairs. I flung the door open and called to the fires as I raced downward. They came in a rush, sweeping through my body like a maelstrom, flinging me from flesh to flame in an instant. No longer restrained by my physical form, I leapt over the railing and surged downward, until the sound of the door above opening again echoed across the silence. I swept back over the railing, keeping to the wall and out of sight as the race downward continued. As I neared the exit, I switched back to human form, and suddenly the awareness of him surged. He was only a couple of floors above me, a dark and forbidding presence that swamped my senses and snatched my breath. I crashed out into the foyer and ran like hell for the doors. Hey, Emberly, Ian called as I raced past his desk. Everything okay? Yeah, I yelled not wanting to say anything and risk the vamp getting into his head. Just got an urgent errand. The door swished open and I raced out into the sunshine. I didn't immediately stop, but ran down the street to put some distance between me and the main entrance. Finally, I stopped and turned around. Eaton had halted on the cusp of sunlight, his face impassive, but his fists clenched. 
The darkness in him rolled out in waves, battering my senses, making me gasp. I dragged my phone out of my purse and took a photo of him as he turned away. I doubted he'd seen me do it, but I also had no doubt that I hadn't seen the last of him. I might have escaped him this time, but that didn't mean they wouldn't try again. And if they knew where I worked, then they knew where I lived. I grabbed my phone and called Rory. Hey, babe, he said, voice cheery. What's happening? Don't go home, I said, the words coming out in a rush. What? Why? Because a vampire intending me no good just made an appearance at the Chase Institute, and I don't think I can risk going home. I don't think you should either. Are you okay? Concern swelled through his voice. Do you want me to come pick you up? I hesitated. I always felt safer with Rory around. He was my rock, the one person I could always turn to. But I also didn't want to drag him into this mess any more than necessary. No, I'll have to report it to Sam, and I dare say he'll arrange a tighter security net around me. I just wanted to warn you, in case they were also watching the apartment. Get Sam to send his people over there. Vamps can't cross a threshold uninvited, so if there are people there, they'll be humans or wares. I will. I just wanted to warn you first. He grunted. Be careful, and call me if you need help. I will. Thanks. I hung up, then dragged Sam's card out of my pocket and dialed the number. A mechanical voice answered, telling me to leave a message. Sam, it's Emberly, I stated, and gave a quick rundown of events. You might want your people to check both Harriet Chase and Abby to uncover just what other information he might have dragged from their minds. And Lady Harriet has a separate security camera system operating in her offices, so grab those tapes. I hung up and jogged the rest of the way to the cafe. Jackson was talking to a dark-haired waitress at one of the outside tables, so I simply brushed past and continued on to the magenta. Early morning or not, I needed a drink. A very large, very alcoholic drink. Jackson slid onto the stool beside me about fifteen minutes later. He ordered himself a beer and another double vodka and orange for me. I'm gathering, he said dryly. That things did not go well at work. You might say that. I finished my second vodka in one long gulp that had my head buzzing pleasantly. Then I got my phone out and found the photo I'd taken. Do you know this man? He studied it for several seconds, then shook his head. Why? Because he claims to be a Professor Heaton, and he's just been employed to continue Mark's work. Only he's a vampire, and he not only had Harriet Chase and her assistant under full mind control, but he got madder than hell when I made a run for it. He took the phone from me and studied the image again. Definitely not someone I know. He scrolled back to the main page, hit several buttons, then attached the photo and sent it off somewhere. I have a friend who might be able to help us pin down his identity, he explained, handing me back the phone. I shoved it away and then smiled at the bartender as he delivered our drinks. A cop friend? Sort of. A secret source you fear to reveal, huh? Yeah. He half shrugged and looked slightly embarrassed. Thing is, your friend Sam and his partner seem ready and willing to roll over everyone and everything to get their answers. I'm not going to waste a valuable source by telling you and having you willingly, or unwillingly, reveal it to them. And I couldn't fault him for that even if I'd already said my mind couldn't be rolled. The only trouble is, Sam is undoubtedly keeping an eye on everyone I contact, and that will include anyone I contact via phone. He'll trace your source's number and probably shut them down. Jackson smiled. Well, no, 
because I actually forwarded the pic to one of my email addresses. It just happens to be one my source has access to and checks regularly. So your source is a female you're intimate with? He raised an eyebrow. And why would you think that? Because I can't imagine a man would be bothered checking for emails from you every day. A woman you're bedding, however, is an entirely different matter. He grinned and didn't bother denying it. I added, did either of the waitresses reveal anything exciting? I'm afraid only Sandy was there, and she none too subtly suggested she was up for being taken into the storeroom. I just about choked on my drink. Really? Truly, he replied somberly, though his eyes were twinkling. Sadly, I had to inform her I already had my hands full when it came to catering to the needs of a woman. I grinned. And a fae can't cope with more than one woman. I'm shocked. He laughed, the sound warm and rich. Not even the fae have unlimited stamina. Had it been later in the afternoon, it might have been a different story. No doubt. So did she reveal anything other than a high sexual drive? Yeah. She and Baltimore were fuck buddies. For the second time in as many minutes, I just about choked on my drink. Jackson slapped my back, his grin huge. Your boss was old, not dead. Which was exactly what Rory had said a couple of days ago. But he's old enough to be her dad. So? I studied him for a moment, then shrugged. I'd certainly lived long enough to know that men only ever stopped thinking about or wanting sex when they were dead, and sometimes not even then. But for some reason, Mark's predilection for much younger women really did surprise me. Did she say how long it had been going on? Ah, he said with a knowing grin. Therein lies the rub. They became lovers in June last year. That's the month Mark started his current project, I said with a frown. Coincidence, eh? Hey? I eyed him for a moment. You obviously think not. Why? Because she was trying to read me. He tapped his head. Felt the buzz of her telepathy. But she didn't have any more luck than that Adam fellow last night. As I said, I tend to rate rather highly when it comes to telepathy resistance. So did she offer the storeroom adventure before or after that? After. I rather suspect I would have gotten a whole lot more than a tasty bit of arse. I snorted softly. So, we have lead number two. Maybe. I mean, that cop friend of yours would no doubt be as aware of her connection to Baltimore as us. Probably, and he'd no doubt had Adam conveniently read her mind and pick out any information. But if she was working for whoever is behind this, why is she still working there now that Mark is dead? Probably for cover. It'd be too obvious if she quit right away. Yeah, but Adam's also telepathic, remember? And he or someone with similar skills, would have interviewed her by now. She wouldn't be working there if Sam's people thought she was involved. Not necessarily. It's not unusual for strong telepaths to be unable to read each other. That might be the case here. Meaning if they'd been unable to read her, they'd undoubtedly have a watch on her. Which also meant Sam would be aware that Jackson had talked to her this morning, and that we weren't letting the case drop as advised. What about Michelle, the other waitress? Interestingly, she hasn't come into work since Baltimore died. I raised my eyebrows. Has anyone contacted her? Yeah, she's sick, not dead. Is she worth talking to? He shrugged. It can't hurt. No. I guess it couldn't. I downed the drink quickly, then rose. Shall we go then? 
What? Now? Getting up so quickly had my head spinning. I had to grip the bar to steady myself. You did get her address, didn't you? Yes. He rose and threw some cash on the counter. Might be worth waiting to see what we get back from my contact, though. I frowned. Why? Because if he came after you, they might also be going after anyone else who had any contact with Baltimore. He rested his hand lightly against my spine, guiding me toward the exit. And that could be the reason for her disappearing act. You said she was only sick. Doesn't mean she actually is. True. I studied the sunlit street as we walked toward his pickup. For the first time that morning, there was no immediate sensation of being watched, and for some reason, concern stirred. My watcher had been nearby when I'd entered the Institute less than an hour ago. So where was he now? And more important, where the hell was Sam? Why wasn't he answering my phone call? Frowning, I added, What about Professor Wilson? Did he have similar liaisons? Wilson was married. If a man is inclined to stray, being married certainly won't stop him, I said dryly. True. And to be honest, it never occurred to me to check. I focused more on Baltimore and you, simply because that's where all the leads seem to be. Not to mention the sex, I thought with amusement. Meaning you haven't talked to the wife? I have, but she was in a rather distraught state, and I couldn't get anything useful out of her. But if Wilson was having an affair, I don't think she knew about it. She seemed pretty clueless about what he did for a living. She may have been clueless about his job, but if he was having an affair, or was otherwise in trouble, she would have had some sense of it, even if she didn't want to confront or admit the situation. Maybe. His expression suggested he didn't agree. I shrugged. Then we need to talk to his friends. If there's one thing I've learned over my many lifetimes, it's that men boast. He grinned. Well, when it comes to a tasty bit of ass, can you blame us? When you're married, yes. I'm not married, and never will be. But if you were, I'd have to punch your lights out. His grin grew. They don't marry. We don't even do serious commitment. Which is a very good thing for both of us. But I merely meant that I don't believe in fooling around with a married man. You're perfectly safe with me, I assure you. Somehow I'm doubting that. My voice was wry and he chuckled softly as I got into the car. You could be right in that. Once I was seated, he jogged around to the driver's side and got in. As he pulled out into the flow of traffic, I flipped down the sun visor and adjusted the vanity mirror to look behind us. Looking for anything in particular? He asked. Just wondering where my official follower is. I've never really spotted him, but I've generally sensed his presence. I didn't when we left the bar, and it just strikes me as odd. Maybe they've been pulled off your tail since events at the Crown. Surely they'd only do that if they'd solved the case, and the vampire at the Institute suggests this case is far from solved. True. He contemplated the rearview mirror for several seconds, then shrugged. The only way to know for sure is to ring the cop. Tried that. No immediate response. I grimaced then thrust the worry from my mind. There was nothing I could do about it after all. Where are we headed? Braidrook. Michelle apparently rents a small house not far from the Braidrook Plaza. Which didn't mean a whole lot to me, as I really didn't know the area. We cruised on in comfortable silence, and it wasn't long before he was slowing in front of a small, double-fronted house whose facade had been beautified, by a wash of white concrete that made it stand apart from its orange-bricked neighbours. Two green rubbish bins stood on the lawn next to the concrete path that led up to the front veranda, and a white station wagon sat in the shared driveway. 
All the curtains are drawn, I commented, peering past him. But the wire screen door is open. And the front door is slightly ajar. He studied the house a bit longer, then parked several doors up. She might be getting ready to leave. Could be. We climbed out of the car and walked back. But as we neared the front gate, something shattered inside the house. Then the screaming started. It was a woman. Back door, Jackson said as he bolted for the front door. I ran down the driveway, my sneaked feet making little sound on the concrete. A large metal gate divided the front yard from the back, but I leapt up, gripping the top, and hauled myself over. Behind me came the sound of a door crashing back against a wall. Jackson, inside the house already. The screaming stopped abruptly, but not the noise. Whoever was inside was on the move, toward me. I bent and ran past a window, then stopped just to the side of the back door. The footsteps came closer. Two men, not one. I flexed my fingers and fireflies danced across my fingertips. Timing was everything. The door was flung open. I stuck a foot out as the first man appeared, tripping him and sending him stumbling. Then I lunged around the doorway, grabbed the second man before he could realize what had happened, and sent him flying into the first man. They went down in a tangle of arms and legs, their heads smashing against each other, knocking each other out cold. They fell in a heap, one pinned beneath the other. More steps approached. I tensed, the fireflies becoming flames inches high, then caught the warm, sunshiny scent and relaxed. Jackson appeared a heartbeat later, his gaze sweeping me, then moving to the two men. Good work, he said, then nodded back toward the house. Call the cops and an ambulance. I'm afraid they made a bit of a mess of the woman. Then don't be gentle with them, I said as I stepped inside the house. Oh, I won't be. His voice was grim, and I realized why a moment later. A dark-haired woman lay sprawled unconscious across the sofa in the living room. Her lip was split, her face bruised and bloody, and her dress was shucked up around her armpits. I doubted they'd had time to rape her, but that had certainly been their intention. I resisted the urge to march outside and punch the shit out of the two men, and moved closer to the woman, carefully checking her pulse. It was fast but strong, and she didn't seem to be having any trouble breathing. I stepped back and called the cops, telling them what we'd found and requesting medical assistance. Then I spun around and went looking for a blanket. I couldn't move her or tidy her clothes without risk of disturbing any DNA evidence that might be present. But I couldn't bear to see her sprawled out like that either. I found a closet in the small hallway and opened it up. Blankets, sheets, and towels sat in neat little stacks inside. I reached for one of the blankets, but as I did, something stung the side of my neck. I swiped at it irritably, but a hand caught mine and something cool and sharp pressed against the side of my head. Make a sound, a soft voice whispered, and you die. Chapter 8 Fire howled through me, thick and angry, but I couldn't focus and everything seemed fuzzy. The fire dancing around my fingertips seemed to be fading, and the roaring in my head was getting louder and louder, but it wasn't flame. My knees buckled, but before I could slump to the floor, someone grabbed me. They ripped my purse from my shoulder, but everything after that became hazy. I wasn't knocked out, not entirely, but what I heard and saw seemed to be coming from a very great distance and didn't have a whole lot of impact. Something was thrown over my body, then I was carried like a sack out of the house. Wind, sunlight, 
darkness and metal vibrating underneath me. Then nothing for a long period of time. Rising to full consciousness seemed to take forever. My head was back to throbbing with an intensity that suggested it was about to tear apart, and there was a bitter metallic taste in my mouth. My shoulders burned, and there was something tight around my wrists and ankles. It took a few minutes to register it was rope. I was tied. Which was better than being dead, I guess. As awareness grew, I remained still and listened to the sounds around me, trying to discover where I was and who might be near. I was lying on something cold and hard, not concrete, but smallish rectangular shapes. Bricks, I thought. Bricks that were slick with moisture. In the distance, water trickled, the sound echoing lightly. The air that swirled around me was stale and heavy with the scents of excrement and rubbish. Either I was in a very old, not often cleaned lane, or I was in a sewer. My vote was on the latter option. After a few seconds, I became aware of footsteps. They were barely audible, and I could hear only one set. But until I knew whether there was more than one person nearby, I wasn't about to give any indication that I was awake. Time seemed to creep by. The pain in my shoulders flared downward until it felt like my arms were locked in agony. And the ropes around my legs were so damn tight they were cutting into my skin and making my toes numb. It was just as well I could take another form, because if I had to rely on this one to react with any sort of speed, I'd be in serious trouble. A phone rang sharply into the silence, and I jumped. Thankfully, whoever was out there didn't seem to notice. Got your parcel, a gruff voice said. You were right. They did go for the waitress. God, I thought. The waitress had been a trap. I should have known that it had all been a little too conveniently timed. She did get a call off to the cops, he continued. So I didn't get the chance to kill the waitress. And the Fae took out my two men. He didn't get the chance. He'd had plenty of time to kill the waitress before we got there, if simple murder had been his intention. I wasn't close enough to hear the other side of the conversation, and that was irritating. I cracked open an eye and peered around. My captor was standing near what looked like a sewer's edge ten feet away. He was tall, broad-shouldered and thick-set, with a bald head that seemed to gleam even in the thick shadows that surrounded us. Even though I couldn't see his face, I knew who he was, having seen a photograph not so long ago. It was Sherman Jones, the man who'd mysteriously disappeared after Mark's murder. Don't worry, they can't tell anyone anything, Sherman said. He swung around and I quickly shut my eye. So there's no problem with the cops interrogating them. What do you want me to do about the waitress, though? He listened for several seconds, then grunted. And this one? Again, silence fell. Then he said, Fine. See you then. He walked toward me and bent down. Even though he was close enough that I could feel the wash of his breath across my cheek, I couldn't really smell him. It was as if something had completely erased his scent. Maybe that was why Jackson hadn't realized he was in the house. Either that, or the scent of the other two had been so strong he simply hadn't had the chance to look beyond it. So, he said softly, his rough fingertips trailing across my cheek. It seems we have an entire afternoon to fiddle before I have to hand you over. Well, you're not passing that time with me, I spat and flamed. The force of it threw him backward, even though he was barely touching me, and it cindered the ropes holding me captive in an instant. I let the flames take me fully into spirit form, then flowed forward. Sherman scrambled backward, his sharp face twisted with fear and his mouth open, though if he was screaming he made no sound. 
I reached out and grabbed him with one molten hand. My flames danced across his clothing, setting them alight but not actually burning them. Not yet. Not until I intended it. I slammed him against the slick brick walls and held him there. Tell me who you're working for, I said softly. Or the flames that surround you will consume you. He made several attempts to speak and eventually croaked. What the hell are you? Something you don't want to mess with. I shook him lightly. Now answer the question. He licked his lips, then said, I don't know his name. I was contracted through an intermediary. Marcus Radcliffe. He shook his head violently. No, I haven't worked for him in weeks. Then who? I directed the flames up toward his face, letting them tease his chin and lightly burn. He gulped. Lee Rawlings. I was supposed to hand you over to him this evening. The timing suggested that Lee Rawlings was a vampire. The same one that had pursued me, perhaps. When and where? Under the bridge near the Red Zipper sculpture at the Flemington Canal. 8 p.m. And is Rawlings the one who hired you to watch the professor? He shook his head. Radcliffe did. Why was he interested in the professor? I don't know. I was just asked to see who he interacted with on a daily basis. Did that mean we had two different parties interested in Mark's work? What about Professor James Wilson? Was anyone following him? How the fuck do I know? I was just employed to follow Baltimore. When he was murdered, I made scarce. I guess that was no surprise. What does Rawlings look like? Sherman shrugged, so I let the flames leap a little higher and singe his whiskers. He yelped and said, Christ, he's tall and thin, like most fucking vampires. Dark hair, brown eyes. And what was the delivery deal? Half before, half later. Half being... He licked his lips. A thousand. I was worth only a paltry thousand dollars. That sucked. Or Sherman was simply cheap. And what about the waitress? He frowned. What about her? Why were you employed to kill her? I don't ask why, he all but whined. I just take the job and do it. So you were told to beat her up and then rape her before you killed her? Sweat beaded his upper lip. He quickly licked it, his gaze darting away from mine. Not exactly. Disgust stirred, and it took every ounce of effort not to burn the bastard to a cinder right there and then. He might have been employed to kill the waitress for whatever reason, but he'd been the one who'd decided on the more savage method, because he enjoyed doing it. What's the security code for your phone? I asked brusquely. Confusion flitted through his eyes, but he rapidly spat out a number. Thank you, I said, then regained flesh and hit him as hard as I could. He went down like a sack of potatoes, hitting the ground with a sharp crack that suggested something had broken. For several minutes, I did nothing more than wince and curse, as the pins and needles in my arms and feet made the mere act of holding human flesh sheer agony. As the pain began to subside, I checked that Jones was unconscious, then rifled through his pockets, discovering in the process he'd landed awkwardly on his left arm and had indeed broken it. Feeling little in the way of sympathy, especially given what he'd intended to do to both me and the waitress, I plucked his phone free. Mine was with my purse back at the waitress's house, and I wouldn't have used it anyway. Not when Sam had it bugged. I flipped the case open, typed in the security code, and saw the time. I'd been missing for more than an hour, 
which no doubt meant that not only would the cops be at the waitress's house, but Sam and his people would be as well. Jackson would have been interrogated, but had enough time passed for him to have been released. Or was Sam holding him somewhere? I guess there was only one way to find out. I hit the text button and typed, Hey babe, I left in such a hurry that I forgot to arrange another date. Ring me when you're free. Once it was sent, I walked around gingerly until the pain in my feet eased, then rang Rory at the fire station and updated him on events. Do you need help? He said once I'd finished. I hesitated. Rory and I had long ago made a pact not to pull each other into dangerous situations, simply because if both of us happened to be killed at the same time, it would be the end of us. While the spirit of a phoenix always rose from the ashes of its death, it was only with the assistance of a ritual performed by their life mate that we were able to regain adult flesh and become whole. Otherwise, our spirits moved on, uniting once more with the Great Mother, never to know life and love and feeling ever again. We'd come close to that once. I had no intention of risking it in either this lifetime or any other future lifetime. And I had a suspicion that this case would get a whole lot deeper and darker before we got any real answers. No, I said eventually. I don't think we can chance it. He swore softly. Damn it, Em. Be careful. You know I'll be here if the worst happens. But I'd really rather just get through more than one lifespan without one or the other of us dying before our time. I smiled. Says the man who is currently a fireman. Hey, I'm not the one who has chucked in the staid life to go chasing after bad guys. He paused. And that's two lifetimes in a row for you. Yeah, but last time I was official. This time I'm just pissed off. He snorted. I still want you to be careful. I will. I promise. He grunted. He'd heard that statement from me almost as many times as I'd heard it from him. Keep me updated, Em. I will, I repeated, then hung up. It took several hours for Jackson to get back to me. Sherman rose to consciousness several times while I waited, and each time I knocked him back out. Although I didn't hit him again, just used pressure points instead. If there was one good thing about living through so many centuries, it was an accumulation of knowledge. Rory had taught me the points after he'd learned the art during his time with an old Chinese kung fu master. The phone rang about four o'clock, but the number that showed up on the screen wasn't Jackson's. I hesitated, then hit the answer button and cautiously said, Hello? Emberly? Is that you? Are you okay? Jackson's voice. Relief slithered through me. Yes, to all three questions. I hesitated. I'm gathering you can talk freely. Yeah. I've borrowed a friend's phone. Thought it would be safer. I winced at the undercurrent of anger in his voice, even though I suspected it wasn't aimed at me. How bad was the interrogation? He snorted. Let's just say I'm surprised that detective friend of yours actually released me. I was sure the bastard was going to lock me up and throw away the key. I'm sure he would have too, except he no doubt wants to follow you. Well, I wish him luck with that. He's not the only one with a few tricks up his sleeve. He doesn't need tricks. He has vampires and psychics. And he apparently has the right to use and abuse the law as he desires. Which is why I won't stay on the phone for long. If they did manage to follow me here, they're no doubt scrambling to find and lock onto this number. Which was my cue to get on with it. Are you able to track my location via the GPS on this phone? I can't personally, but I know someone who could. I smiled. You must have some very interesting friends. And if you play your cards right, I might just introduce you. 
I snorted softly. Except when they're a source you don't want exposed. Exactly, he said cheerfully. I'm gathering you don't know where you are. Well, yes and no. I'm in a sewer somewhere, and I have Sherman Jones lying unconscious at my feet. He's arranged to hand me over to a vampire going by the name of Lee Rawlings this evening. I want to go to that mead and talk to him. That might not be a great idea. There was doubt in his voice. Vamps can be tricky to deal with at night. They can't shadow when there's light, I commented. Remember what I am, Jackson. Can one phoenix raise enough light to stop a vampire shadowing? A fae sure as hell can't. I can. Ah, well, that's a different story. He paused. It may take me a little while to get to you. Will you be okay? Well, I've been in better smelling places, but I'll be fine. I hesitated and glanced down at my captive. Bring something that'll keep a were-rat bound. I want to hand Jones over to Sam, but not before we get to that meeting. Will do, he said, and hung up. I walked around a bit to ease the lingering remnants of the pins and needles, then sat down next to my captive and played solitaire on his phone to pass the time. It was close to 6pm by the time I heard footsteps. I shoved the phone into my pocket and silently rose, clenching my fingers against the flames that instinctively danced across my fingertips. Emberly, Jackson said softly, as his form began to emerge from the darkness. Don't flame, it's me. Tension slithered from me. I'm glad you're finally here. If I had to play solitaire too much longer, I would have gone stir-crazy. He grinned and shoved a coffee container at me. Thought you might need this. It's green tea, not coffee. I took a sniff. Not just green tea, but mint green tea. You, I said, dropping a quick kiss on his lips. Are a darling. And you, he said, the amusement on his lips crinkling the corners of his bright eyes. Stink. I snorted. Not exactly surprising given I've been sprawled all over a sewer tunnel. But unattractive all the same. A shower is required before we go anywhere near that meeting this evening. He pulled a coil of metallic rope from over his shoulder and squatted beside Sherman. Did you ask him about Baltimore? He said Marcus Radcliffe hired him to watch Mark and take note of who he talked to on a regular basis. Did he say why? I drank some tea, then shook my head. Which is not surprising. It didn't take much to get him to talk, so he wouldn't have been trusted with anything vital. Where rats are never trustworthy. Jackson muttered. It's the nature of their beast. I raised my eyebrows. So, what is the nature of the Fae? Besides being Randy's sensualist, that is. He glanced up and grinned. You struck it lucky. Unlike most of my kind, I'm more beta than alpha. Which means I generally ask for opinions before I do whatever the hell I want. I laughed. Yep, that about sums you up. He finished trussing Sherman up and then rose. I'm pretty sure I got in here without a tail. But just in case, let's exit via a different sewer cover. As he tucked a hand under my elbow to guide me forward, I said, I'm going to need somewhere to shower and change. He nodded. I've booked a room in a hotel not far from where we'll exit. And I borrowed some clothes from my friend's wife. She's about your size. Oh, and I retrieved your purse from the waitress's place. You've thought of everything, haven't you? I teased. His grin was bright and cheeky. Trust me, I do expect payment in kind. I laughed. 
Of course. We wound our way through the tunnel system, following the little GPS map he had on his phone. Where the hell he managed to get an app that showed the sewers, I had no idea. But I wasn't about to grumble. Not if it got us out of this stinking place sooner rather than later. After about twenty minutes, I'd finished my tea and we'd finally reached our exit point. Once he checked that there was no one close, we climbed out. I took several deep breaths of air unfouled by rubbish and excrement, then looked around as Jackson replaced the cover. Where are we? Dorcas Street, South Melbourne. The hotel is just down the road. He caught my hand and tugged me forward. If I know Sam, he's probably got an electronic eye on all the hotel bookings, so he's going to discover our location sooner rather than later. He would if I were using my own card, but I'm not. Another friend, I said dryly. He smiled at me. He really did have a nice smile. He owes me several large favors. I saved his wife once. From what? From a rather nasty kidnapping and extortion attempt. He shrugged. The police weren't happy about my involvement, but who fucking cares when there's a life at stake? That, I said with a smile, is the alpha speaking, not the beta. He glanced at me, eyes twinkling. And also the reason the cops in this city and I don't see eye to eye. He tugged me through the hotel's lobby. I blinked at the vibrancy of the red feature wall, but didn't get much of a chance to see more than that as we strode quickly to the elevators. In no time at all, we were zooming up to the eighth floor. As it turned out, we didn't have a room, but rather a suite with a generous living area, separate bedroom, and a small kitchen. The shower is in the ensuite, Jackson said. And the fresh clothes are on the bed. What would you like to eat? A big steak with lots of potatoes and another mug of green tea. I stripped off and headed for the shower. He was right. My clothes stank. A woman after my own heart. Except for the whole green tea bit. I've had enough coffee over the centuries. Time for a change. You know... I always wondered what being with a much older woman would be like. I have to say, it's better than I imagined. I laughed as I shucked off the remainder of my clothes, then headed in to clean up. Twenty minutes later, the luscious aroma of roasted meat told me dinner had arrived, so I hurriedly finished dressing. Though there was no underclothing, a fact for which I was grateful, because I drew the line at wearing cast-off bras and panties, the rest of the clothes he'd borrowed fit me nicely. My butt was obviously a little bigger than the wife's, because the jeans were rather tight, and the shirt fit like a glove, exposing more than it covered. A deliberate choice, I suspected. Thankfully, he'd also borrowed a coat. I could cover up and keep warm when I needed to. His gaze skimmed me as I walked out, and a grin split his face. Nice, he murmured, his gaze coming to rest on what the shirt wasn't covering. Shame we haven't got time to peel off that shirt and explore what lies beneath. You know what lies beneath, I said, amused. You've explored them once or twice already. Ah, but a good explorer is never afraid to retrace his steps on the off chance he missed something vital. I snorted. Let's concentrate on the business at hand, shall we? Oh, I was, he murmured. But he sat down and uncovered two plates. Steak, mashed potatoes, and several helpings of vegetables. Right, he said, as he picked up his cutlery and began to tuck in. While I was twiddling my thumbs waiting for your former boyfriend... And just how do you know he's a former boyfriend? I inquired mildly. He waved a fork. It's obvious given the way you talk about him. 
I'm guessing it ended badly, but some part of you isn't quite over it. He'd guessed entirely too much. I waved him on irritably. Amusement danced in his bright eyes as he continued. My friend got back to me about that pick I sent her. She couldn't find a match. So our mysterious Professor Heaton hasn't got a criminal record. Nor a driver's license. Inconvenient. Yeah. He munched on some steak for several minutes, then said, Said friend is going to do an overseas search to see if anything comes up, but that may take a while. Which leaves us with the vamp tonight. Hopefully he'll be able to enlighten us more than Jones did. If not, we go back to the waitress who tried to seduce me and do a little backroom interrogating of our own. I nodded. We also need to talk to Wilson's wife and the friends. I really don't think the wife will be able to tell us anything more. Doesn't hurt to be sure. His expression was dubious, but he didn't disagree any further. We finished our meals in companionable silence. Then I grabbed my purse and borrowed coat, and we headed out. Though it was after seven, the rush hour traffic lingered, and it took forever to cut across town. Along the way, I rang the number Sam had given me, telling him the GPS coordinates for Jones's location, and letting him know what had happened, but not what Jones had said. He'd be pissed, I knew that. But having made the decision to see this thing through to the end, that was exactly what I intended to do. And while I knew it probably wasn't the smartest decision I'd made in my many lifetimes, it would hardly rate among the worst, either. That honour went to the time I'd decided to become a nun. The vows of poverty, chastity, and, worst of all, obedience, had not sat well. Darkness had well and truly settled in by the time we reached the park. As Jackson paid the driver, I climbed out and studied the huge wrought-iron struts that jutted out of the ground at an angle. How anyone could call it a sculpture, I had no idea. But then I'd lived through some of the greatest errors when it came to sculpture and painting. When compared to the sculptures Rodin and Bernini, both of whom I'd known, had produced, this might as well be scrap metal randomly stuck in the ground. Jackson shoved his hands into his pockets and stopped beside me. The last four spikes are unlit. I'm thinking that's not a coincidence. Probably not. He glanced at me. You realize I'll have to carry you over my shoulder to the meeting. He'll be jumpy enough when he realizes it's not Sherman. I nodded. That's probably the only way of getting me close enough to encircle him with fire anyway. Jackson glanced at his watch. Eight minutes. I'm betting it'll pay to be early. I'm betting you're right. He touched my elbow, lightly guiding me across the road. Then, in the shadows of the bridge, pulled me over his shoulder, fireman style. Play dead, he said. As long as you don't play with my ass, I retorted. He chuckled softly, the sound vibrating through my body. As tempting as it is to have such a lovely ass so close to my hand, I suspect shifting my grip and risking dropping you would not be a wise move on my part. Too right, I muttered. And can we please move? Despite what literature says, this is not the most comfortable way of being carried. It's supposed to be more comfortable for me rather than you. Just get on with it. He laughed softly and headed under the bridge and down to the canal. It was fenced off with high wire, but had been cut in several places, so it was easy enough for Jackson to squeeze through, even carrying me. He walked along the banks of the concrete canal, following the line of red-painted metal until he neared the shadowed section. There he paused. Lee Rawlings, he said, not raising his voice. If the vamp was out there, he'd hear us. I have a parcel delivery for you.
For several seconds, there was no response. Then, you're not who I was expecting. The voice was smooth and urbane, but it wasn't the voice of the vampire who'd claimed to be Professor Heaton. Jones decided he couldn't risk being seen, Jackson said. The police want to question him about some murder, and he'd rather not talk. And who might you be? Let's just call me a subcontractor, Jackson said. Now, do you want your delivery or not? She may look light, but trust me, she ain't. I resisted the urge to dig an elbow in and remained still. While we still had no idea just how well the vamp could see, he would be able to hear the beat of blood through my body. I had to keep my pulse rate slow for this to work. You may leave her there and go, Rawlings said. I shall pay Jones himself when I catch up with him. Jackson snorted. Hardly. The deal was half before, half after. Cash on the line, buddy, or no delivery. Rawlings was quiet for several seconds, and I wished I knew what the hell was going on. But with my nose stuck on Jackson's back, I couldn't see a damn thing. After several moments, Rawlings said, Very well. You may approach. So generous of you. Jackson muttered, making me smile. He carefully navigated the steep canal sides, then splashed his way through the thin layer of water lying at the bottom. Far enough, Rawlings said. Jackson stopped slightly sideways, and suddenly I could see. And what I could see was feet. Jackson's. It wasn't a lot of help. Money first, Jackson said. If you think you can throw twenty feet, that is. I don't appreciate wet cash. Thank you. Thank you, I thought, and called to the fire. Only this time, instead of using the flames that burned within me, I called to the heat of the world around us, the fire of the earth and the energy in the air, gathering it, weaving it, then casting it out to form a circle that was bright and fierce, but also surreal. This wasn't normal flame. This was the flame of the mother herself, and she burned with a fire that danced with the colors of all creation. What in Hades? Rawlings said, even as Jackson said, Holy fuck, that's impressive. You can lower me now, I said and he hastily did so. Even in the vivid brightness of the flames that surrounded him, Lee Rawlings was a tall, thin shadow of a man. His eyes were as dark as his skin, and his thick, glossy hair glinted with blue highlights. He was also very, very angry. It poured off him like sweat, stinging the air and making it hard to breathe. Not telepathic, but empathic, meaning he could not only sense the emotions of others, but, as he was doing right now, use them as a weapon. Although in this case he was amplifying his anger rather than ours. Stop projecting and remain still, I said flatly, or the flames will burn you. That thickening sensation eased, and suddenly I could breathe again. What trickery is this? Rawlings' hands were clenched, and the anger that no longer burned through the air vibrated through his body. What this is, Jackson replied evenly, is an information exchange. You tell us what we want to know, and you can walk away with your skin unburned. His gaze flickered between the two of us. Him walking away didn't seem to be on his agenda right now. Trust me, I said softly. Any attempt to do anything more than walk away would not be wise. I flicked a finger, and a slither of flame danced apart from the main ring of fire, 
shimmering softly as it curled toward Rawlings and almost lovingly wrapped around his ankle. His pants instantly began to melt away, but I withdrew the flame before it did any real damage. Rawlings didn't scream, didn't react in any way, really. And oddly enough, the anger in him seemed to fizzle away. But old vampires were very good at that sort of thing, and I very much suspected Rawlings was one of the old ones. His speech was too formal for him to be a more recent recruit into the vampire ranks. What do you wish to know? Who do you work for? Jackson said immediately. And why do they want Emberley? He studied us for several moments, then said, I work on a commission basis. You can threaten me all you like, but it would be far easier if you simply paid me for the information. That raised my eyebrows. You'd risk rushing out your employer. He half smiled. It was not a pleasant thing to behold. That shows how little you know about the vampire syndicati and how they work in these matters. As I said, I merely accepted this commission, and I can give you nothing more than the next person in the chain. I do not know the person behind the order. I will never know. Well, the next person is better than nothing. Jackson glanced at me, and at my nod added, How much will it cost? One thousand. That is the fee I will lose. I seem to be going rather cheaply, if you ask me, I muttered, resisting the urge to rub at the ache beginning to form just behind my eyes. The fire and casing rawlings might not be mine, but it still pulled at my strength. I couldn't keep it going indefinitely, not unless I wanted to become little more than ash and flame myself, and that would not please Rory. Rawlings' gaze flicked briefly to me, and in its dark depths, amusement briefly glinted. Despite that he hired himself out to the vampire syndicates, I had a suspicion he wasn't intrinsically bad. Having witnessed your rather extraordinary skills, I would agree that you most certainly are going cheaply. His gaze went back to Jackson. Do we have a deal? Yes. Wire the money into my account immediately. Jackson drew his phone from his pocket, and as Rawlings recited the number, made the transfer. Rawlings nodded. The vampire who employed me for this parcel pickup was one Henry Moretti. I cannot give you his address, and I suspect the phone he called on is either generic or untraceable. He reeled off a number, then added, And I was not told why he wished you collected, only that I was to be here at this time to collect you, and then deliver you to an address in Laverton North. Why would you deliver me to what is essentially an industrial area? He raised an eyebrow, the movement rather eloquent. Where else would you question someone without suspicions being raised? Most of the warehouses around that particular address are not 24-hour. Charming. I thought with a shiver. What address? He gave it to us, then added, I have lived up to my part of the bargain. I now expect you to live up to yours. Do not try to attack us, I warned. We made a deal. I will not go back on that. An honorable criminal. Amazing. I glanced at Jackson, who nodded. I took a deep breath and released my hold on the flames. They shimmered for one brief moment longer, then their heat dissipated, retreating to the realms of earth and air. Rawlings bowed slightly. Thank you, he said, then promptly disappeared. 
Jackson's nostrils flared. He retreats, as promised. Good. I rubbed my temples wearily, wishing I had some aspirin. Jackson frowned at me. You okay? I will be. Creating those sort of flames takes a bit out of me, that's all. Do you need tea? Painkillers? Yes, but I'm guessing you don't have either right at this particular moment. No, but there's a 7-Eleven not far down the road. If you think you can walk there. The only place you two will be walking. A sharp, all too familiar voice said. Is straight into two goddamn jail cells. I looked up quickly and my stomach sank. Sam and Adam strode toward us, and to say neither of them looked particularly happy would have to be one of the understatements of the year. Sam's body practically vibrated with anger. Ah, Detective Turner, Jackson said equably. How nice of you to join us. Sam barely gave him a glance. He was too intent on glaring at me. What the fuck do you think you're doing, Emberly? This isn't some sort of game, you know. I bit back the instinctive smart-ass reply that rose to my lips. I know. Then to repeat, what the hell are you doing here? Waiting for some criminal? Meaning he hadn't seen Rawlings, which put us up one on him although what good it would do if he threw us in jail, I had no idea. I told you. You told me you were going to be sensible. This is not what I call sensible. He planted himself in front of me, his hands clenched near his sides, and a blanket of darkness emanating from him. You were both warned to stay clear of this investigation. I'm being employed to investigate Professor Wilson's death. Jackson said flatly. And if that means I also have to investigate Baltimore's, then so be it. Sam's gaze flicked to Jackson. The darkness in him sharpened, even as his control seemed a little more tenuous. Fear skipped lightly into my heart. I had a bad feeling we did not want to see his control slip. Sam took a half step forward, leaving me sandwiched between the two men. I don't think he even realized he was doing it, because he was so focused on the fae at my back. A fae who was more than ready to give as good as he got, if the coiled readiness I could feel in his body was anything to go by. You had better. Sam's voice was little more than a harsh whisper, but the force of it seemed to shudder the air around us. Start listening, or else... Adam placed a hand on Sam's shoulder, as if in warning. Sam growled, the sound animalistic, then drew in a breath and released it slowly. He glanced down at me, and awareness flared. Awareness and hunger. It was thick and sexual, and it stormed through me, making me ache even as the dark heart of it had fear stirring again. After a moment he stepped back. The darkness in him receded, but not the awareness, not the hunger. Adam, get both their asses out of here. Take them to headquarters. Adam raised a pale eyebrow. That will not please Henrietta. Right now I don't fucking care. Just do it. Adam hesitated, then said, And you? I'm going to the hospital to question Michelle Rodriguez. He glanced at me. It wasn't a pleasant experience. I'll interrogate them when I get back. Adam studied him for a moment, then nodded. You two follow me, and please do not attempt to run. It would be a fruitless waste of all our time. I glanced at Jackson. He just shrugged and tucked his hand under my elbow, both guiding me forward and offering support in case I needed it. We were shoved into the back of a waiting van, which had no windows and no seats, forcing us to hunker down on the metal floor. 
The rear door slammed shut, and darkness closed in. After a few minutes, the engine started and the van drove off, taking us God knew where. Well, this is the first time I've been arrested in quite a while, I muttered, drawing my knees up to my chest. Flames flickered across my hands, but given the energy store was very low, they barely lifted the darkness. Jackson's eyes were little more than a pale glitter. He raised his eyebrows. Meaning this lifetime or past? Past. I gave him a lopsided smile. You'd be surprised at some of the things I've done. Amusement tugged at his lips. Actually, I wouldn't. I dare say a being who keeps getting reborn has more than her fair share of tales to tell. Yeah. I paused, then added. Although being burned at the stake as a witch was not the punishment they thought it would be. He laughed, but his attention wasn't really on me. I contemplated his intentness and realized he was listening to the sounds around us. A tram rattling by the peal of a church bell, the heavy bass thump of music. Normal noises that meant nothing unless you needed to retrace your steps. Jackson was planning just that, I suspected, or at the very least wanted to be able to should the need arise. So I watched him quietly, sensing we'd moved through the city and out the other side. Not too far, but somewhere close to the ocean, the distant call of seagulls ran under the night's stronger sounds. St. Kilda, I thought. There was a major police hub here, but I wouldn't have thought it'd be a suitable location for a specialized task force. But maybe that was the whole idea. Eventually the van dipped downward, then stopped. Doors slammed, and then the rear doors opened. Adam motioned us out, and with two other men escorted us through a series of tunnels that were cold and bleak. PIT, it seemed, didn't believe in making their guests feel welcome. Jackson was placed in one room, me in another. It was little more than a concrete box, and was sparsely furnished, just a couple of long benches divided by a table, all of which were concrete. They obviously didn't believe in comfort either. I scanned the walls, looking for mics and cameras and finding none. That one fact chilled me more than my bare surroundings, simply because it meant they kept no formal record of what went on in these rooms. They really weren't tied to the rules of the regular police force. I shivered and began to pace, half wishing Sam would hurry up and get here, but fearing what would happen if he did. Outwardly, at least, he wasn't the person I'd known. That darkness. Another shiver ran through me, and I rubbed my arms. Something had happened to him. Something bad enough to change his very essence. It was more than an hour before he did arrive, by which time I was practically climbing the walls. But as my gaze met the blue of his, I realized that was precisely what he wanted— me on edge, desperate to get out. Bastard. He stepped into the room, a paper coffee cup in each hand, and what looked to be a Blackberry tablet tucked under one arm. The darkness, or whatever it was I'd sensed earlier, had retreated. How far, I had no idea. But in its absence, he seemed a whole lot more... human which seemed the wrong word to use, given that was what he actually was, and yet it oddly fit. Thought you might like some tea. He slid one cup across the table and kept hold of the other. His voice held none of the cold abruptness that had been a constant in most of his dealings with me, instead hinting at warmth. But it was a warmth I couldn't afford to believe. I made a short, somewhat humorless sound. Last time I had a drink in your vicinity, I ended up drugged. Oh, for God's sake, Em. He picked the cup up and took a drink. Happy. 
I somewhat gingerly picked up the cup and sniffed the contents. It smelled like ordinary, everyday green tea. There was no weird scent that I could detect, but that didn't really mean anything. These days they had all sorts of drugs that were odorless and tasteless. I cautiously took a sip. It did taste like ordinary, everyday green tea. Now that we have that little drama over with, he said, voice a weird mix of annoyance and amusement. Will you please sit down? Sorry, I prefer to stand. Besides, sitting would bring me far too close to him. I had a hard enough time resisting his presence when he was being a bastard. There was no way I'd cope being near this less frosty version. Don't let him hurt you again, Rory had said. It was a warning that was very much uppermost in my mind at the moment. Sam shook his head and made a sharp, whatever motion with his free hand. Fine, your choice. Tell me about Lee Rawlings. Why? It's not like you haven't found out all you need the same way we did, via Sherman Jones. Adam is interviewing Jones, but I haven't received the report yet. I took a drink of tea, then said, And you'd also like to cross-check information, just to make sure we didn't get anything extra. That too. I snorted softly. Why am I here, Sam? We've done nothing illegal. You're interfering with an ongoing case. That in itself is enough to confine your ass in jail if I so desire it. And do you? Desire it, that is. His gaze swept me. The twin fires of need and fear stirred in its wake. The desire was echoed in his eyes. That depends. On what? He slammed the blackberry on the table, then sat down on the concrete bench. Your answers. And you staying away from this case as ordered. Jackson is a legal private investigator, and he's being employed by Rosen Pharmaceuticals to uncover who murdered James Wilson. Which wasn't exactly the truth, given what they wanted was his research rather than his killer. But Sam probably knew that. You can't legally prevent him from doing his job. I can if he gets in my way, and he is. Just for a moment, the darkness resurfaced, staining his eyes and expression, making me wonder yet again just what had happened to him, what was still happening to him. But it disappeared as quickly as it had appeared. Fierce self-control, or had something else happened in the hour or so since I'd last seen him? But that doesn't explain why you're involved, other than the fact that you've always been bloody stubborn. These people killed my boss, They've also made several attempts at snatching me, one of them successfully. None of which would have happened if you'd just done as you were told, he cut in. You don't believe that any more than I do, I retorted. So can we just cut the shit and get down to the questions? I want to get out of here. He studied me for several seconds, and my heart began to beat just that little bit faster because there was hunger in his eyes, a hunger that had nothing to do with the deeper darkness within him and everything to do with desire. He still wanted me. After all that he'd said, after all the anger and hurt and sense of betrayal, a betrayal both of us felt for very different reasons, he still wanted me. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry, because if there was one certainty in this life, it was that he and I would never end happily. I turned away to break the spell of his gaze and took a gulp of tea. It didn't do a whole lot to ease the fires that had begun to burn low down in my belly. Fine, he said abruptly. What exactly did you get out of Lee Rawlings? I looked at him sharply. Nothing. He wasn't there. You guys turned up and no doubt scared him away. He gave me a long look. We both know that's not the truth. 
Adam picked up the resonance of another life as we approached. Someone else was there. Adam was wrong. I started pacing again. The coldness in the room was beginning to get to me. It crawled across my skin like a live thing and made me shiver. Adam is a vampire. He's never wrong when it comes to the resonance of life. Well, I guess that naturally means I'm lying then, doesn't it? I guess it does. The question is, why? We're both after the same thing. We want the people behind these murders brought down. I want answers, Sam, and I'm not likely to get them from you, am I? I downed the rest of the tea and tossed the cup toward the table. He caught it reflexively, his actions so fast they were almost a blur. I frowned. What is going on with you? You've changed, and I don't just mean emotionally. We're not here to talk about me, he said, voice still surprisingly mild, despite the flicker of annoyance in his eyes. Stop changing the subject and start answering questions. I continued pacing but crossed my arms, trying to ward off the growing chill. I have nothing to say to any of you. You can leave me in this cell to rot if you want, but I can't tell you what I don't know. Sadly, I knew you'd say that. I gave him another sharp glance. And what does that mean? It means you were right. The tea was drugged. Blood drained from my face, and I stopped abruptly. What? He shrugged and rose. I figured you wouldn't cooperate, so we dropped a little something into the tea to ensure that you would. But you drank some of it. Only a sip. It wasn't anywhere enough to affect me. He hesitated. I am sorry, but it was a necessary step. We need answers, Em, and we need them now. I stepped away from him, but that chill in my body was growing, making my feet go numb, and I stumbled. Sam caught my right elbow and directed me backward until my back was pressed against concrete. He placed his other hand under my left shoulder, effectively pinning me. Tell me what Lee Rawlings said. He was close, so close. His breath teased my lips, and his warm, woody scent filled every breath, making my nipples pucker and sending shivers of desire curling through my belly. The desire in his gaze sharpened a caress of heat that rolled over me, making me tremble, making me yearn. I opened my mouth, then closed it again, took a deep breath and released it slowly. Go fuck yourself, Sam. Anger flared, deep and fierce. Its intensity was frightening, but once again it was just as swiftly smothered. Trust me, I was fucked a long time ago. Now just answer the damn question, Red. I closed my eyes and battled the need to obey, it would have been far easier to give him what he wanted, but something within me just wouldn't allow it. He was right. I could be bloody stubborn when I wanted to be. Stupid, even. Because really, what was I gaining by resisting? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I licked my lips, saw his gaze drop to follow the movement. Heat rolled over me, thick with desire, fanning the flames within to greater heights. What is the drug you gave me? N41A. It's designed to restrict certain paranormal powers, and it also acts as a truth serum of sorts. What did Rawlings tell you? That he was just another delivery boy. That the real meat was with a Henry Moretti in Leverton. But somehow I kept the words inside. Define what you mean by restrict. That means he will not be able to flame. It was created for those with talents such as telekinesis and pyrokinesis, but we figured it would probably work on rarer creatures such as yourself and the Fae. I'm not human, Sam. You have no idea how that drug will affect me. 
When you're in this form, human drugs will affect you the same way as they will affect any other human. In this case, it means you won't have full use of your flames for 48 hours. He studied me for a moment, almost seeming to lean in closer, as if he intended to kiss me. But his gaze was on mine rather than my lips, and the fires of desire were banked in his eyes. I wished I could say the same about mine. The paranormal investigations team has a long history of studying non-humans, and while phoenixes might be rare, they are not unknown to us. Meaning if he was right, I was without my one major form of protection. But they obviously didn't know everything. Any drug introduced into my system in flesh form would burn away in spirit, and no drug, no matter how strong, could stop a return to my true self. Only a lack of strength from within could do that, and right now, thanks to everything that had happened, I was running low on reserves. They were unknown to you five years ago. That was before I joined PIT. I've learned a whole lot in the last year or so. Shame you never learned it's impolite to drug the people you want cooperation from. And it was a shame the words came out a whole lot huskier than I'd intended. We don't. It's only those we can't read and who won't cooperate we drug. Tell me about Rawlings, Emberley. I did. I couldn't help it. The words vomited from my mouth. Rawlings, his orders, the meeting details. Even how much we'd paid for the information. At the end of it, Sam grunted. He said nothing else. I glared at him. No. Good. He hesitated, his gaze sweeping my face and his lips suddenly closer even though he hadn't moved. There's one other thing about the drug I forgot to mention. My stomach did a strange flip-flop, but I wasn't entirely sure whether the cause was his words or the brush of his breath against my lips as he spoke. Gee, colour me surprised. I intended sarcasm, but it came out far more breathless than that, and the desire in his blue eyes sharpened abruptly. It ran around me like a storm, and all I wanted was for it to sweep me away. But that would be a very bad thing to happen. I had enough trouble now for getting his kisses. I didn't need a refresher to make it all that much harder. That drug, he said softly, his lips so close to mine I could practically taste them. Is also something of an enforcer. You will obey what I say now that it is in full effect. But thankfully only until the moment I have the strength to take on my fire form, I thought. Damn it, Sam, don't do this. You give me no other choice. There's always a choice, Sam. You just have to want it enough. Again, his gaze swept me, and I knew in that moment I wasn't mistaken, that he did want me. Badly. I was in a whole heap load of trouble if he actually acted on it. Emberly Pearson, he continued softly. You will not go anywhere near Henry Moretti or the meeting in Laverdon. You will stop pursuing all leads pertaining to the murder of your boss. Bastard. Totally, he agreed. Then a heartbeat later, his lips met mine. It was a fierce thing, this kiss, both familiar and yet not. It was everything we'd once shared and yet so very raw and different. It was hunger and desire, darkness and desperation, and it reflected all that we once were and all that had changed. It proved how much I still wanted him, and he me. But it also confirmed just how different he now was, because where once I tasted nothing more than joy and desire, heat and passion, there was now also ash and anger, fierce and barely restrained, and it spoke of the night and even darker urges. I'd never kissed a vampire, but I imagined they would taste something like this. But Sam wasn't a bloodsucker. 
He'd been out in the sunshine often enough to prove that. I had no idea what had happened to him, but the mere fact I could actually taste the changes scared the hell out of me. We broke away with a suddenness that tore a gasp from my throat and left me dizzy and breathless. His gaze, when it locked on mine, was hot, hungry, and yet also very angry. With me, with himself, and with the world in general, I suspected. Stay away, he growled, leaving me wondering if he meant from the case or from him. Then he pushed away from the wall, away from me, and I collapsed into a heap on the floor. The last thing I remember seeing were his boots as he walked away. They were the boots I'd given him as a birthday present six years ago. Chapter 9 As consciousness resurfaced, I realized I was no longer in the cell. Hard concrete still lay underneath me, but the chilled air was now filled with noise. The hum of traffic, the rumble of a tram rattling past, distant voices rising over the heavy bass beat of music. Obviously, we were no longer at PIT headquarters. So where the hell had they dumped us? I rolled onto my back, only to discover there were madmen in my head armed with hammers they were not afraid to use. I groaned loudly. A familiar voice said, Yeah, I know exactly how you feel. I cracked open one eye. Jackson sat a couple of feet away, his back propped up against a huge wrought iron strut that jutted out of the ground at an angle. I frowned. How? The word came out scratchy and I paused. Swallowing heavily in an attempt to ease the dryness in my throat. The hell did we get back to the zipper sculpture? I'm guessing your charming ex had us dumped here. He shrugged, his gaze sweeping me critically. You okay? Other than feeling like I've had far too much to drink without the fun of the alcohol, you mean? He laughed softly, then groaned. God, don't make me do that. It hurts. Meaning they drugged you too? Or did they get a little more physical? They drugged me. He paused and added with a wry smile. Oh, I wouldn't have minded getting physical. My interrogator was that fey babe I've sensed a few times, but never seen. Meaning Rochelle, no doubt. How long have we been here? Do you know? He shrugged. Five minutes or so. I slowly, carefully pushed myself into a sitting position. It felt like my head was about to explode, and for several minutes it was all I could do to keep breathing and not throw up. One thing was certain. I was not going to take fire form any time soon. Not until I got to Rory, anyway. Eventually, I said... Did they order you away from Moretti in the Baltimore investigation? Yeah, he grimaced. But the drug won't stop me from at least trying to head over to Leverton the minute we get in the cab. I didn't say anything, just watched as he took a deep, somewhat shuddering breath, then pushed to his feet. He stood there for a moment, body wavering and face green, then carefully shuffled toward me. Come on, we need to get out of here. I accepted his offered hand and let him haul me upright, but I wasn't entirely sure in the end who was holding whom upright. I'm not going to be able to walk far in this state, I muttered. There's a taxi stand down the street. I frowned. What about your truck? I don't think it's wise to be driving in this state. I'll retrieve it later. He tucked his arm through mine and we made our way slowly out of the canal and back onto Flemington Road. It was late, but there were still plenty of cars on the road, their headlights pinning us briefly in brightness before sweeping on. Two cabs were waiting at the stand. We climbed into the first one 
and the driver gave us a somewhat dubious look. Where to? Jackson opened his mouth, but no words came out. He glanced at me, his expression suddenly furious. He really couldn't say the Laverton address. I licked my lips, picturing the address in my mind, determination high. We need to go, I said, but got no further. The words really wouldn't come out. Jackson swore violently, then said, 65 Stanley Street, West Melbourne. When I glanced at him, he added, my office and home. I nodded and relaxed back in the seat as the cab took off. It didn't take all that long to get across to Stanley Street. Jackson paid the cabbie, then we both climbed out. Wow, I said, looking around. The street was wide, but divided by center parking and pretty flowering trees. And the buildings lining either side of the road were a mix of light industrial and old Victorian. Close to both the Queen Vic Market and Flagstaff Gardens. The rent here must be horrific. He shrugged, then cupped his hand under my elbow and directed me across the road toward a double-story Victorian building that was little more than two windows wide and squashed between a blacksmith's shop and an electrical store. I can ride it off, and having the residence above it actually saves me money. He dug his keys out of his pocket and stopped at the pretty blue-painted building, opening the wrought iron gate before ushering me through. I walked up the two steps and leaned against the adjoining wall. Hellfire investigations, I said dryly. Really? He gave me a weary grin as he brushed past to open the door. I'm a fire fay. Any business I'm involved in is always going to have a name relating to fire. But surely even a fay could think of something more imaginative. Oh, we can, and often do. He ushered me inside. But it usually involves sex, or sexual positions. I smiled and studied the long, thin room. It wasn't your traditional office. There was no reception area, just a couple of desks, a half dozen comfortable chairs, and a line of filing cabinets along the left wall. At the far end of the room, there was a lounge area with several couches and one of the biggest espresso machines I'd ever seen outside a cafe. Jackson obviously had a serious love for coffee. A spiral staircase sat to one side of this area. How many people do you have working for you? No one, he said, relocking the door. Hellfire's a one-man operation. Why? Is it because you're a fae, and fae tend to be solitary creatures? He hesitated. If I'm being honest, that does play into it. I've certainly been thinking about bringing someone in for a while, but I haven't found anyone I could stand to be with for eight hours, or more, a day. I raised my eyebrows, amusement teasing my lips. What? Not even a female? Oh, there are plenty of females I could stand being with. I just wouldn't want to work with them. He shrugged. I had a feeling he didn't really care one way or another. He added, Would you like a cup of tea? Please. I trailed after him as he walked across the room. So what do we do now? Given the restrictions they've placed on us, we've got no choice but to concentrate on Wilson's murder and somehow find the link to Baltimore. But if we do find a link, you won't be able to act on it. I sat on the thickly padded arm of one of the couches and crossed my arms. There was a weird mix of fire and ice in my veins, a result of both Sam's kisses and the drug. Damn it. I could have resisted. I should have resisted. But I'd wanted that kiss too much. And the result? Confusion. Complete and utter confusion. While there was no denying the desire that still burned within me, I had to wonder how much of it was fueled by memories of what we'd once had. Because the man I'd tasted in that kiss was very different from the man I'd fallen in love with. My Sam was undoubtedly still there, 
if buried deep. The problem was I wasn't sure I even liked the man he was most of the time, so how the hell could I love him? I scrubbed a hand through my hair and wished like hell I could travel back in time and erase the events of the last few days. My life had been a whole lot easier, and I hadn't appreciated it enough. No, but at least we can pass it on to your cop friend. Water spluttered as Jackson filled a teapot. He glanced over his shoulder. I take it you're still intending to pursue this. Hell yeah, the bastard's not going to get the better of me. Atta girl. He brought the teapot and a cup over to me and placed it on the nearby side table. You want something to eat? If you've got something sugary, that would be good. Ice donuts coming up. He returned with a large box of donuts, then made his coffee and plonked down on the seat beside me. Tomorrow we'll start talking to some of Wilson's friends. I nodded, too busy munching on donuts to speak. Between us both, we demolished the entire box of twelve, as well as several hot drinks, in very quick time. And now, he said, collecting both the cups and dumping them in the sink, it's time for bed. A smile teased my lips. Oh, really? Yes, really. He offered me a hand. To sleep. Nothing more, I promise. A fair going to bed with a woman and actually intending to sleep. Damn, that has to be one for the record books. He laughed softly, tugged me up into his arms and dropped a sweet kiss on my lips. It went some way to removing the taste of ashes and darkness. Trust me, he said softly, his forehead resting lightly against mine. It saddens me greatly that I cannot raise anything more than the desire to hold you in my arms. I wish it were otherwise. Sleep, I said softly, is all I really want. Good, he said, and tugged me up the stairs. By the time I woke up, the sunshine flooding the far end of the room was bright and warm, suggesting it was closer to lunchtime than to breakfast. I rolled onto my back and realized I was alone in the bed. A quick look around provided no clue as to where Jackson was, which meant he was probably downstairs. I stretched the kinks from my body, then scooted upright, hugging my knees as I looked around. Like the floor below, the upper living area was really nothing more than one big, open space, the kitchen was centrally located and had all the latest mode cons, as well as a sink filled with dishes. The living area was on the left side of the room and contained a TV that dominated an entire section of wall, while the bathroom, or at least the shower and the bath, were in the opposite corner to the right of the bed. An open closet was situated nearby, filled with an untidy mess of clothes. Beyond that was a door which led into the only separate room on this entire floor, the toilet. My stomach rumbled a fierce reminder that I really had to feed myself if I wanted to regain the strength I needed to burn the drug out of my body, so I bounced out of bed and padded across to the kitchen. A quick investigation of the fridge provided a can of coke and half a dozen cold cuts of chicken. I consumed several of those, then grabbed the coke and went in search of my clothes. After retrieving my phone from my purse, I walked across to the windows. Sunshine caressed my skin, warm and intoxicating. I closed my eyes and let the heat infuse me for several minutes before I dialed Rory. He answered on the second ring. How did things go last night? Good and bad. I updated him on all that had happened, then added, The drug he gave us was N41A. It not only restricts psychic abilities, but acts as some sort of enforcer. Until it's out of our system, we can't pursue Mark's murder. But the minute you burn into spirit form, it'll lose effect. Yes, except right now that's not really an option. I'm running rather low on reserves. 
Em, that's a dangerous state to be in with all this shit going down. I can get time off work if you want. No. I cut in. I mean, yes, we will have to meet later today. But don't take time off. You can't afford it. You're far more important to me than my damn job. I smiled, warmed as much by the caring so evident behind the words as the words themselves. I know, but given the drug's restrictions against following our one good lead, it's not like we can get ourselves into too much trouble before tonight. I'd like to get a hold of an antidote if there is one, though. I have a feeling the drug will leave Jackson incapacitated longer than either of us might desire. He might be a fire fae, but it's not like he can become flame and burn it out of his system. That may not be a bad thing. I mean, it's Sam's job to catch the bastards behind Mark's murder, not yours or Jackson's. I know that. Jackson knows that. And neither of you care. He sighed softly. If a government department is using that drug then there's got to be an antidote for it somewhere. Which is exactly why I called. Do you think Mike might be able to get his hands on it? Mike was one of the teenagers who attended Rory's Kung Fu classes at a run-down community centre in Newport on the weekends. He'd been on the street since he was eight, and had survived by selling his body, stolen goods, and these days, information and drugs. Not just any drugs, but the hard-to-come-by black market kind. The kind a kid his age should never be able to get a hold of. He and Rory had formed an odd sort of friendship. Probably, I think, because Rory accepted rather than judged. He could hardly do anything else when we'd both travelled Mike's path more than once in our lifetimes. You do whatever it takes to survive, and sometimes that whatever is neither pleasant nor on the straight and narrow. I'll ask. If he doesn't know about it, he might be able to point me in the direction of someone who does. Just tell him to be careful. Sam's people tend to play rough. Oh, and don't go back to the apartment yet. Not until we're sure it's safe. We'll have to go back there if you want to renew. I know. I just don't want to risk either one of us being caught alone at the moment. I paused. Although, to be honest, I wouldn't mind going for a drive to find somewhere remote. After all, before flameproof rooms had come along, that was exactly what we'd had to do. It would be a nice change. I could hear the smile in his voice. You'll ring. I will. Just don't go home in the meantime. I won't. I'll bunk down at Rosie's for a couple of days. Good. But if they know as much about phoenixes as they claim, they could well be watching the fire station and you. I'll oh, be careful. Just make sure you are. Remember, I want us both to live to old age this time around. He hung up. I tossed the phone back onto the pile of clothes, then finished the coke and went in search of Jackson. I found him at one of the desks downstairs. Do you often work at your desk naked? Only when I think it might induce a pretty lady to come sit on my lap. He caught my hand and tugged me toward him. I was, however, beginning to think said pretty lady was intending to sleep all day. I sat astride him and wrapped my arms loosely round his neck. Need stirred within, need that was both sexual and something stronger, fiercer. Hunger got the better of me. So it seems. He dropped a quick kiss on my lips. Sadly, it seems to be for chicken rather than me. Hey, I'm here now, aren't I? I shifted and his breath hitched. The heat within him rose several notches. I flared my nostrils, drawing it in, allowing his warmth to slither through me, refueling the ragged edges of my soul. I was careful, though. He might be a fae, but I couldn't take too much of his heat for fear of weakening him. But then all I really needed was enough to keep the edge of utter exhaustion away. So, what dragged you out of a warm bed? Thoughts about Mrs. Wilson. 
He brushed his thumbs across my nipples. Delight skittered through me. Not erotic thoughts, I hope. Hardly. Although I'm having a few now. So was I. What kind of thoughts were you having about her, then? Rather than answering, he shifted one hand, gripping the back of my neck to hold me still as his lips claimed mine again. The kiss became a long, slow dance of exploration and pleasure. Neither of us was breathing very steadily by the time he broke away. It's your fault. I ran a fingertip down his abs. What is? The question was absently said. Right now, I wasn't really caring about anything more than the tension that lay between us. I slid back on his lap to expose his erection, then played my fingertips across it. His cock leapt with every light caress, as if begging for more. Me being down here instead of in bed. His voice, little more than a low growl, made my senses hum. You suggested Wilson's wife would have had some sense of him being in trouble, even if she didn't want to confront or admit the situation. So? So, he murmured, his concentration seemingly more on caressing my breasts than what he was saying. It just got me wondering whether Mrs. Wilson was as clueless as I'd thought, so I came down here to do a little investigating. I slid my fingers down the length of his shaft, then gently cupped his balls. His breath hitched again. I smiled impishly and began massaging him, the rhythm of my movements echoing his. And what did you discover? That she is not as clueless as she appears. Surprise, surprise. I removed my fingers, then slid myself over his shaft, letting my wetness coat him as I slowly moved up and down the length of him. Yeah, he said, voice a little strained. Seems she and Wilson hadn't known each other very long before they were married. He ducked his head and caught one nipple in his teeth, teasing it lightly. Shivers of delight skittered through me. He released me abruptly, then swirled his tongue around the puckered, aching nipple, his touch light and erotic. I closed my eyes and simply enjoyed. But as my movements against his shaft got ever stronger, he groaned, gripped my hips, then thrust inside me. For several moments, I didn't speak, didn't move, didn't do anything more than simply enjoy the sensation of him being so very deeply inside. How did you discover that? Oh, Mrs. Wilson has a Facebook page. She announced she'd met the man of her dreams in May of last year, then declared they were getting married a month later. Wow, one of them is a fast worker. Hmm, he agreed. Then his lips caught mine again. And there was no discussion about Mrs. Wilson or her Facebook page for many, many minutes. Just a whole lot of passion and heat. Heat that ran through me, fed me, even as I fought the urge to take all that I needed and leave him depleted. We came as one, our groans echoing through the large room as our bodies shook and shuddered. He made one final thrust, then briefly rested his forehead against mine, his breath warm against my lips. That, he said eventually, is a fine way to start the morning. Except, I noted, brushing the sweaty strands of his hair from his cheek with my fingertips, it is no longer morning. Let's not quibble over minor differences. He dropped a kiss on my lips, then said, So, Mrs. Wilson, not only did our loving couple have an extremely fast courtship, but they were married the same month as Wilson began his Red Plague research. What a coincidence, I said dryly. I was still sitting astride him, and I couldn't help but notice that while he might have only just come, he was more than half ready to go a second round. Faye, it seemed, were insatiable.
I'm gathering this led you to dig deeper into our Mrs. Wilson's past. It did indeed. He slid his hands down to my butt and then lifted me up and deposited me feet first onto the floor. To say I was surprised was an understatement. He grinned. You need to turn around and look at the computer. I did so. On the screen was an image of a pretty blonde with pale blue eyes and a cherub's face. Easy to see why Wilson might have fallen hard for her, although a pretty face doesn't mean she was up to no good. And if Sam suspected that she was, he would have already investigated her. Indeed, Jackson agreed. He reached around me and clicked open another screen. Especially since dear Amanda has been married a number of times before. I raised my eyebrows. And did these unions all end in a bloodthirsty manner? If you're asking if she killed them, then no, apparently not. One husband died in a car crash, two were divorced, and I haven't been able to track down the other, simply because she married him overseas, and it apparently didn't last past the honeymoon. Four, five husbands. I blinked and studied the blonde. She doesn't look old enough to have had that many already. She doesn't keep them very long. She's been married to Wilson the longest. I studied the blonde in the picture for a moment, knowing there had to be something else here. I could feel the excitement thrumming through Jackson, and while part of that was undoubtedly sexual, there was definitely more to it than that. So, I said slowly, it begs to question, what was she after? Money, or something more? His lips brushed my neck. I do so love the way your mind works. He reached past me and opened another screen. Information scrolled up. Husband one was a biochemist. Hubby two, a bioengineer. Three worked in the weapons department for the military. And four is a black market fence, from what I can gather. So aside from that one blip, it seems she has a thing for researchers. Or a thing for the information or items she could get from them. Which we wouldn't know until we uncovered more about her. Even so, she was looking less like a clueless blonde and more like a schemer. I swung around and faced him. So what happened to the husbands after she left or divorced them? Ah, that's where it gets really interesting. Husband one was sacked two days before his accident. Husbands two and three also lost their jobs and were found dead a few days later. Suicide was the coroner's official verdict. As I said, I'm still trying to uncover what happened to four. Meaning our Mrs. Wilson is something of a latent black widow. Possibly. More than possibly, I suspected. Why did the first three lose their jobs? It seems there were discrepancies in their departments. I raised my eyebrows. Discrepancies? Labs being broken into, research going missing, that sort of stuff. And the husbands were blamed. They took the fall because they were in charge. Aha. Uh -huh. We really need to talk to her. We do. He dropped a kiss on my nose, then caught my hand and tugged me toward the stairs. But not before I've ravished you senseless. I really think talking to Mrs. Black Widow could be a little more important than sex. Well, yeah, but Mrs. Black Widow is currently at the hairdresser, and that usually takes at least an hour, doesn't it? I followed him up the stairs. How do you know this? Facebook? Nope. I read her calendar when I was interviewing her. How do you know she's not just getting a quick trim? He gave me a long look over his shoulder. Anyone would think you were looking for an escape clause. All you have to do is say no, you know. I grinned. I'm just worried that Sam will get there before we do, and that'll somehow ensure we lose any clues we might otherwise have gained. 
If he were investigating the wife, he would have done so by now. We reached the top of the landing, but continued toward the shower rather than the bed. He was obviously intending to combine two necessities. Now, how about we quit the questions and just concentrate on the business at hand? I grinned as he tugged me closer. Concentrating as ordered, sir. And I did. So, he said, stopping his truck several doors up from Mrs. Wilson's house. Who were you talking to when you first woke up? He had good ears because I hadn't been talking that loud. Rory. And who's Rory when he's home? He shifted in his seat to look at me, but his expression was nothing more than curious. Every phoenix is one of a pair. He's mine. His eyebrows raised. He's your mate? Not exactly. I half shrugged. He's my lover, my friend, the other half of my soul, and the only man I can ever have children with. But we cannot, and do not, love each other. Not in the romantic sense. Really? What the hell did your people do to earn that sort of curse? That is a million-dollar question, I'm afraid. He shook his head. Does that mean you're unable to fall in love at all? No, we can, and do, but it's part of the curse that our relationships end badly. I don't think I've heard of one phoenix having a happy ending in all the centuries I've been alive. Certainly I've never had one. But just because you haven't heard about it, or experienced it, doesn't mean it can't happen. Well, no, and I certainly keep hoping every time I'm reborn that this will be the one time it's different. I shrugged. But I know for sure it's not this lifetime. He eyed me for a moment, then said, Because of Sam. Another one loved and lost, I'm afraid. That sucks. Big time. Living forever always has a drawback. This curse is ours. Vampires don't seem to have many drawbacks. They live on blood and they can't ever walk in sunshine. My voice was dry. Those are pretty big drawbacks in my book. Neither would worry me, especially if it meant more time chasing luscious ladies. He paused, looking thoughtful. So have you and Rory had any kids? We've only had five, because we aren't fertile every rebirth. I shrugged. I haven't seen any of our children for a generation or so. Phoenix offspring don't tend to linger near the family nest once they find their mate. And how does that happen? I take it there's a bit more involved than dating until you find the right one. I smiled. We don't date. At the age of sixteen, a ceremony is performed, and our mates are revealed. From there on in, you're bonded for life. He frowned. What if you happen to hate your bonded partner? That would totally suck, but it's never happened. Fate's not that cruel. I wouldn't bet on that. He glanced at his watch, and his frown deepened. How long does it normally take to get your hair done? I blinked at the sudden change of topic. Around two hours if she's getting it dyed. Not that I actually knew for sure, as I never got anything other than a cut. Phoenix is aged normally through each cycle, but I'd grown rather fond of the grey over the years. Why? Because she should have been back by now. Maybe she went shopping or something afterward. Maybe. His frown deepened. I've just got this itchy feeling something's not right. I didn't think intuition was a fey thing. My gaze swept the street. There was a white car parked several doors down from Wilson's place, and a woman cutting roses in a garden further along the street, but neither pricked any sensation of wrongness. Generally, it's not. He frowned at the house for several moments longer, then dug his phone out of his pocket and made a phone call. 
Your secret source has to be a copper. I noted in amusement once he'd finished. Very few other people would be able to get you the location of a car via its GPS that quickly. Maybe. His voice was noncommittal. But apparently her vehicle is sitting in the driveway of her home. I glanced at the empty driveway. Someone's removed the GPS system. Which suggests the itchy feeling may have been spot on. A devilish light entered his eyes. Shall we go investigate? If you break and enter, Sam will throw you in jail. Only if he catches us. Come on. I shook my head, but climbed out and waited while he fidgeted in the back of the truck for several minutes. The day was bright and warm, and I tugged off the light sweater I'd borrowed from Jackson, allowing the sunshine to caress my skin and continue the refuel of my inner fires. Although soon I'd need more than just sunshine and the threads of energy I could steal from Jackson, and that meant getting back to Rory. Jackson shoved several items into his pockets and then headed up the driveway. I followed, then watched from several steps away as he knocked on the door. It was loud, but had an oddly hollow sound, which for some reason had visions of death stirring. I rubbed my arms lightly. I was no stranger to the variations of death, but that didn't mean I ever welcomed its appearance. Jackson stepped to one side and peered in through the window. Not a lot to see, other than dust. Given her husband just died, dusting would be the last thing on her mind. He gave me a wry look. Remember, we're talking about a potential black widow here. I know, but she'd at least want to stay in character until the inquest into her husband's death was over. True. He stepped back, gave the front of the house a once-over, then stepped off the veranda and moved around to the backyard. He peered in a few windows, then gripped the back door handle and hit the door hard with his left shoulder. The lock gave way with very little fuss. Remind me to get our locks replaced with stronger ones when I get home, I said. He gave me a somewhat absent grin. There is no such thing as a fay-proof lock. Then I shall coat the door with silver or something, which would not stop me or anyone else from getting into your home if we were determined enough. He took two cautious steps inside, then stopped abruptly and swore. What? I said immediately. Blood. He put a hand into a pocket and pulled out some rubber gloves, handing one pair to me. Wipe the door handle with your sweater, will you? How bad is the blood scent? I tugged the sweater free from my waist and gave the handle a thorough wipe down. Bad enough. He hesitated and lowered his voice. But there's something else here. A scent I can't quite put my finger on. Something you've smelled before. Or someone. Sparks flickered across my fingertips. Bright, but not dangerous. I wasn't sure whether it was a result of the drug or my own lack of strength, but either way, it meant that if we were attacked, I'd be relying on my earthier skills rather than my elemental ones. I licked the trepidation from my lips and said, Is that someone still here? I don't know. I can't smell anything that suggests he is, but then I didn't last time either. He glanced over his shoulder and added, Close the door behind you. We don't want the neighbors seeing the open door and reporting it. I pulled on the gloves, then closed the door and drew in several deep breaths. The scents he could smell so clearly weren't evident to me. We moved quietly from the laundry room into the kitchen. It was small but neat, but there were dishes draining on the sink and fat congealed on the top of the water. I dipped my gloved fingers into it. Stone cold. Much like the house, really. I followed Jackson into the next room. 
Again, it was as neat as a pin. And other than the light coating of dust over the wooden surfaces, there was nothing out of place. But the living room was even colder than the kitchen, and as I rubbed my arms, I realized why. The AC was not only on, but set to near freezing. Jackson moved into the shadowed hallway beyond the living area. A cautious check of several rooms that led off it revealed neither our black widow nor anyone else. Yet the tension in Jackson seemed to be growing. Whatever he smelled was obviously getting stronger. The final room turned out to be the main bedroom, and it was in here that we found Amanda Wilson. She lay on her back, one hand tucked under her neck, and her long hair streaming across her pillow. If not for the red splatters across the nearby pillow and the paleness of her skin, it would have been easy to believe she was asleep. She looked at peace, happy even. But maybe that was because she hadn't been alone in the bed before her death. Not if the indent on the other pillows and the state of the sheets and blankets were anything to go by. Obviously, the vampire responsible for this had taken his pleasure both physically and through her blood. Although, judging by the blood on the pillow, he was one messy feeder. Jackson stepped over the bundle of bed sheets dumped on the carpet near the end of the bed and carefully gripped her chin, turning her head to one side to reveal a deep and ugly bite wound. I closed my eyes briefly and took a deep breath but it did little to calm the instinctive rush of distaste and fear. Though I was more than aware that not all vamps got off on vicious blood-taking, that indeed it was usually an orgasmic experience for both parties, my encounter with the vamp who'd sucked me dry had left me more than a little wary of them, not to mention a total unwillingness to go anywhere near them sexually. Obviously, though, Amanda had shared no such unwillingness, Oh, fuck, Jackson said suddenly. She's alive. What? How? Her lips are blue and she's not breathing. She is, but it's so shallow it's practically unnoticeable. Call an ambulance before we lose her. I dragged out my phone as he pulled the covers up and spread them over her. But before I could dial, something solid hit the back of my head and sent me flying. Chapter 10 I hit the wall face first, and pain exploded. For several seconds I saw nothing but stars dancing happily in black space. Then hands grabbed me, pulled me around, and threw me again. This time when I hit, there was a splintering sound, and I came down in a shower of wood and glass. Dressing table, I thought fuzzily, and instinctively reached for my flames. Nothing happened. Nothing more than a slight fizz of heat that faded as quickly as it rose. I swore and groped for something, anything to use as a weapon. There was blood in my mouth. My vision was blurry and there was a roaring in my head. But I still heard the heavy approach of footsteps. My fingers found wood, but it was too small, too thin to use as a weapon. I swept my fingers around desperately for something better and hit glass, a long, thick shard. I wrapped my fingers around it and gripped it tight. The ragged edges sliced into my skin, but I made no move, no sound, as those steps drew closer. Feet appeared in front of my face, big feet encased in heavy black boots, the kind that could do serious damage if they stomped down on my head. Tension slithered through me, the need to move warring with the need to be still and play helpless. Whoever this was, he was strong. Without my fires, all I had was surprise. My grip on the glass tightened. Blood began to ooze past my fingers and soak under the carpet. He bent down, grabbed the back of my shirt and hauled me upright. Heat rolled over me, heat and the pungent musk of man and sweat. And I realized that my attacker was a werewolf rather than a vampire, which explained the strength. 
It was a thought that quickly vanished as he held me at arm's length and gave me a toothy grin. You should have done as the cop suggested, he said, because now you have to die. Shock rolled through me. Sam had been the only cop to warn me away from the case, but surely even he wouldn't resort to this sort of violence. But he's changed, the internal voice whispered. He's not the man you once knew. No, I thought, he wasn't. But I still refused to believe he was behind this attack. I batted away the lingering uncertainty and said, through puffing lips, I've done the whole death thing more than once, and I have to say I'm not quite ready to do it again. With that, I plunged the shard of glass as hard as I could into his gut. He released me instinctively and screamed, but it was a sound that held fury rather than pain. I landed in a heap at his feet, but I didn't stay there. I twisted, swept my leg around, and knocked him off balance. He half fell, and I threw myself forward, knocking him back and sideways. But he was a man, and a werewolf, and that meant fast reflexes and greater strength. The advantage I'd gained in unbalancing him lay in seconds, not minutes, and he was up almost as fast as I was. I hastily wiped at the blood gushing from my nose, then ran at him again. I hit shoulder first, and the jagged edge of the shard sliced into me even as I drove it deeper into his gut. He flailed backward and crashed into the closet doors. With a howl that was still more fury than pain, he ripped the shard from his flesh and flung it away. And in that instant, I knew my time was up. If I didn't drop him now, it'd be me on the floor, not him. I leapt at him, feet first. He saw me coming and twisted sideways, but his gut wound had at least slowed him enough that it didn't matter. I hit his left knee side on and there was a loud crack. His leg collapsed from underneath him and he went down hard to one knee. But the bastard just wouldn't fall. I hit the carpet yet again, sucked in a shuddery breath and half turned, saw his fist arcing toward me and flung myself desperately out of the way. The punch missed, but the heavy rings on his fingers gouged my skin. It hurt. God, how it hurt. But I thrust the pain aside and scrambled away from him. Hands grabbed my right leg and dragged me back. I half yelped, then twisted around, kicking at his face with my free leg. It missed and he laughed, the sound fierce and cold. His gaze met mine, and all I saw was death. Flames flared across my fingertips. They contained little in the way of heat, but it was all I had left, so I flung them at him. His eyes went wide, then he released me and threw himself out of their way. Another roar escaped his lips as he came down on the knee I'd broken. Then the flames hit him, and he screamed again as they shimmered up his legs. I didn't wait for him to realize they contained no heat. I lunged at him, slipped my hand under the cuff of his jeans and grabbed his ankle. The minute my fingers wrapped around his flesh, the fires within responded, sucking in the heat of him, feeding on it. I drank it fast, robbing him of warmth and energy, until his skin was grey and shivers racked his body. It wasn't enough. I wanted, needed more. But if I took it all, I'd kill him. And as desperately appealing as that thought was, we needed answers more. I unlocked my fingers and peeled them away from his flesh, leaving the imprint of my hand on his skin, a lasting reminder of our fight. Then took a deep, shuddering breath. It did little to quell the urge to finish what I'd started. But as my breathing calmed, I became aware of the sounds. Grunts and the smack of flesh against flesh. The werewolf hadn't come alone. Jackson. I scrambled to my feet, lunged for the biggest piece of splintered wood I could manage, then ran for the door. Jackson fought a man who was little more than a shadow. The two of them appeared evenly matched, going blow for blow, their bodies shuddering under the impact of each hit. 
Jackson had the mother of a bruise forming under his eye, and slashes along his cheeks and arms. The vamp obviously wasn't afraid to use his nails. I took a step toward them. The vamp hit Jackson hard, sending him staggering, then spun and ran for me. He was lightning fast, and I really had no time to do anything more than raise the wood. He didn't see it. He just ran straight into it. The jagged edges rammed into his body just below his ribs, and blue fire instantly exploded from the wound, consuming the wood as it rolled across his body. He screamed, burned, blackened, fell. I stepped back and rubbed my arms, my stomach rolling as the pungent scent of burning flesh and meat filled the air. He stopped screaming, stopped writhing, but still the fire consumed him, until there was nothing left but ashes and the cindered remains of the carpet underneath him. At least it was a quick death, and that was probably more than he deserved. Damn it, Em, Jackson growled. I wanted to question him. My gaze shot to his. It wasn't like I meant to do that. It was more luck and instinct than thought. Yeah, I know. It's just damn annoying that every step forward in this case is followed by two steps back. In this particular case, it's only one step back. The other one is still alive. Really? Well done, you. He thrust a bloodied hand through his hair. We'd better check Amanda before we interrogate him, though. You want to make that call to the paramedics? I followed him into the bedroom to retrieve my phone. Jackson glanced at the werewolf and then back at me. Damn, that's a mountain, not a wolf. Very well done, you. The bastard very nearly got the better of me. I bent to pick up my phone, but that just made the blood oozing from my nose flow faster, and half the screen was covered in an instant. I walked over to the bedside table and grabbed some tissues. He didn't, and that's all that matters. I guess. I shoved the tissues up my nose to help stop the bleeding, then called an ambulance. How is she? I asked when I'd finished. She's still alive. He tossed me a handkerchief. It's clean. You might want to use it on your hand. I quickly wrapped it around the cut, but it didn't do a whole lot. Let's hope she remains that way. If the wolf can't tell us much, she could be our only hope. I can't imagine your ex is going to allow us to talk to her once he finds out about our adventures here. He was right. Sam would close out this avenue of investigation just as surely as he'd closed off Moretti. He might not use a drug to do it, but he didn't need to. All he had to do was place Amanda under protective custody. We could always ring the police rather than him, it might only delay the inevitable confrontation, but it would at least give us some time to question her. It's worth a shot. But when you do talk to the bastard again, give him a fucking earful about drugging us. Not having our fires could have gotten both of us killed today. I raised an eyebrow. And do you think he'd care? Probably not. He walked around the bed. Ring the cops. I'll tie up our thug and do a quick search through the house. It might be a good idea to drag him into another room. If the paramedics arrive before his healing fully kicks in, they'll want to treat the bastard. And while I wasn't against scum getting medical help when they needed it, after what he'd helped do to Amanda Wilson, a little bit of pain and suffering was the least he deserved. Besides, his wounds were already showing signs of healing. That is another good idea. I'm full of them today, I said, voice dry. My usual response to a statement like that is full of shit more likely. He sent a cheeky grin my way. However, I sincerely desire you in my bed tonight, so I shall restrain the urge. Oh, I'm so glad to hear it. He laughed, then grabbed the wolf's arms and, none too gently, dragged him into the next room. 
while he tied up our captive with some wire coat hangers he found in the closet, which, under normal circumstances, wouldn't have held him for long. I called the cops. With that done, we searched Amanda's house. Unsurprisingly, we didn't find anything useful. As the distant wail of the approaching ambulance began to cut through the air, Jackson said, We're out of time. Let's go question that wolf. I followed him into the back bedroom. The wolf hadn't moved, but his skin had lost its gray pallor, and his breathing seemed easier. If he wasn't yet conscious, he was damn close to it. Jackson grabbed a fistful of the wolf's shirt, pulled him partially upright, then slapped his face, hard. The sound reverberated through the stillness. Stop foxing, you furry bastard. The wolf made a low sound that seemed to rumble up from the depths of his boots. It wasn't a particularly dangerous sound, but that he was conscious enough to even do it meant he was a whole lot stronger than I'd presumed. I could have drained him more, should have drained him more. I crossed my arms and tried to ignore